lead and beloved senior. Margaret liked being out. She liked being around people. She was very friendly, very outgoing. Is viciously murdered in her own home. Oh my Lord, it's her. And I pretty much lost it. I actually thought I was going to get sick. To be snuffed out in such a way is just horrific. Police uncover a trail of suspects. How would he know the information unless he was in the crime scene? Having people know how she was found and even what she was wearing is very suspicious. It just wasn't adding up. He was not being honest and something else was going on. Before a disturbing discovery. He was just photographing her in her own home. Points to a deranged killer nobody saw coming. I don't think anyone in law enforcement could have had any inkling of the outcome of this case. This is sick. This is not a normal murder. This wasn't a horror movie. This was actually happening. Wadsworth, Ohio, a haven for families just outside Akron. Wadsworth, a very quiet town. It's very community-oriented. It's a great family community. It's very common for people not even to lock their doors because there's never a lot of crime that occurs right around in there. On a Monday morning, April 9th, 2018, the peace is interrupted when police receive a call from a worried citizen. Watcher, police. Yes, this is Howard Leisure. My aunt lives on uh, Portage Street. A friend of ours stopped over there yesterday to check on her, and she was nowhere to be found. Okay. He says papers were on the porch for the last three days. What's her name? Margaret Douglas. Initially, the police department was contacted about Margaret being missing from her home. We don't know where she's at. She's 98 years old. Does she lived there by herself? She lives there by herself, yeah. And she never locks her house. So our initial response was to look for Margaret to see if she had fallen inside her home and needed help. Patrol officers walked through it, yelling for her to see if she would answer. We continued to canvas the neighborhood, and we did not locate her. If her close friends, she's not with them, something's wrong. We contacted area hospitals and looked in any possible place that she could be. Margaret was just basically missing. That evening, Howard and his wife, Cindy, head to Margaret's home to help police with the search. They asked if we could come down and meet them at the house. Howard and Cindy started to look for some items common for Margaret to have taken with her when she left. There were specific shoes that she would wear. They were looking for a little red wallet that she carried her money and her credit cards in when she left the home. So Howard went to look in that front closet. The clothes had dropped or slipped down that was piled in the top of the closet. He said, oh, I found her shoe. He tried to pull the shoe out. And I touched it, and it felt cold and clammy. The shoe was still attached to Margaret, who was in the closet. And I thought, oh my lord, it's her. And I pretty much lost it. Something I'll never forget, I'm sorry. But to find her like that. It was a terrible shock, especially for her nephew, Howard, and I just remember the look on his face. I actually thought I was going to get sick. I think we were just so appalled and shocked that someone would kill her. What motive could there be to kill a 98-year-old woman? What could she have done to anybody that would have resulted in that? Margaret's home is declared a crime scene, and homicide detectives arrive. Margaret was positioned with her head down in the corner and her backside kind of up in the air. Her underpants were torn inside the closet there. Her nightgown was all unsnapped, and her bra was pulled up. I immediately thought that there was a sexual element to the crime. There was a lot of trauma to... Margaret's neck region. 
Somebody was able to strangle her, and my assumption was manually due to the lack of any ligature marks. Looking at the uh, condition of Margaret's body, rigor had came and gone. You could look at the uh, different lividity and the pulling of the blood inside the body to see it appeared she had been there for a few days. As the forensics team gathers DNA and fingerprints, detectives search the house for further evidence. Her wallet was not located, so that gave us an indication that maybe this was a burglary and they had made off with just the wallet. Margaret didn't always lock her doors, so we weren't surprised when we didn't find forced entry into her home. Investigators find their first clue outside the home. I observed a plastic food service glove on the back side of the house and collected the glove just in case that it was involved. There was not a lot of physical evidence at the crime scene. Besides the glove, the missing wallet was something, but nothing that would direct us in a certain way. Who would attack and kill a 98-year-old woman in her own home? As they set out for answers, detectives turned to Howard and Cindy to learn more about Margaret. The best thing to do is to get to know your victim as best you can. Born in Akron, Ohio in 1919, Margaret was known as a woman of strong character with a fiercely independent streak. She knew what she wanted and she wasn't afraid to go after what she wanted to get. Margaret often told us about her days working at the O'Neill's in downtown Akron. She liked being out, she liked being around people. She was very friendly, very outgoing. Margaret had very strong opinions, and she was certainly not afraid to tell you what her opinion was. She was a pretty independent woman, let's put it that way. After World War II, Margaret married the love of her life, Army veteran Donald Douglas. If I saw Margaret, I saw Donald, her husband. They were made for each other. They just complimented each other. The couple moved into the house that Margaret would live in for the rest of her life. I think Margaret might have lived in that neighborhood close to 70 years. It was Margaret and Donald's choice not to have any children. And they seemed extremely happy together. They liked to travel together. They went to ball games. They enjoyed going to the Indians game. When Donald passed away in the year 2000, Margaret chose to remain in her house, surrounded by friends and caring neighbors. Margaret was a pretty good friend with the neighbors, David and, and his wife. There was another neighbor across the street. Her name was Jan. They just sort of kept an eye on Margaret. She knew all the kids in the neighborhood. But as she got older, she just got more restricted to the house. And that's when me and my wife stepped in at that point and started taking her shopping and doing things for her that is needed. Margaret loved the fact that she was 98 years old and she wanted to be 100. She truly loved life. For someone to have lived such a wonderful, vibrant life only to be snuffed out in such a way is just horrific. I have a grandmother that's similar in age. It's just very hit close to home. The investigators were under a tremendous amount of pressure. Every one of them took it very personally, and I think every one of them wanted to find justice very quickly for the family. At the onset, we had no clue. There was no direction. Maybe it's financial. Maybe it was a relationship issue. Maybe it was an argument that went too far and something happened that they didn't expect. But at that stage in the investigation, you just don't know. We need to start somewhere, so we start closest to her. So that would include uh, looking at Howard and Cindy. We definitely leave everyone on the list until we can exclusively rule them out and have that be a certainty and not just a feeling. Coming up, is Margaret's killer hiding in plain sight? He knew details of where Margaret was found and in what state she was found. He's come back to the scene of a crime. Detectives unearth dark secrets. We found a journal about a desire to kill people. He was videotaping her while she slept, stalking his victim like an animal stalked its prey. Leading to a killer no one saw coming. This is somebody that's ultimately going to be a serial killer if he's not caught. Police.
police are investigating the murder of 98-year-old Margaret Douglas, whose body was discovered stuffed in a closet in her own home. I just can't imagine a 98-year-old woman being that terrified and not knowing what to do. It's definitely one of the most traumatic things I've ever had to experience in my years with the Wadsworth Police Department. Detectives begin by interviewing those closest to Margaret, her nephew Howard, and his wife Cindy. We fingerprint and get DNA from Cindy and Howard to show whether their fingerprints or DNA were on something that it should not have been on. We did subpoenas for phone records and also location data, GPS data, so we could tell their whereabouts during the time in question. Cindy and Howard lived approximately 30 or 40 minute drive away but they would come into town a couple times a month to do her grocery shopping. We she always paid with cash. We swung down, went to the bank, she paid $200 out to go shopping with. Police ask Howard about Margaret's finances. Was there anyone who stood to gain from her death? Margaret was really in charge of her own finances. We did look into those accounts and check for activity. We were never able to locate any activity that was out of the normal. Does she have a power of attorney or a will or anything then? No. We've been telling her she needs a will, she needs this. She would never get to take the time to do it. There was nobody that we could find that would have any financial gain from her death. Could Howard or Cindy think of anyone who might wish to harm Margaret? Any problems with her? Is she wanted to argue with people or anything like no. that? Nothing? No, she don't like it. And nobody else she didn't, you know detectives ask about others in close contact with margaret according to howard and cindy the closest is margaret's former neighbor david clinkenbeard Cindy and Howard did keep in contact with David, who was Margaret's main caregiver. David would come and check on her a couple of times a week just to see if she was okay and if she needed anything. David has the most contact with her. Yeah, he'd go every week, take her trash out, and then he'd take the can back in the next day. So. After interviewing Howard and Cindy, detectives try to contact David, but he's not answering their calls. There was some concern not being able to reach David, and that that was troubling. We didn't have any other suspects. It made us wonder what was going on. As detectives try to track David down, patrol officers continue to canvas Margaret's neighbors for information. During the canvas, we did learn that there had been some vehicles in the neighborhood that had been rifled through, and small items were taken out, like change and things like that. Is this somebody that was up by Margaret's house and found a crime of opportunity because it's somebody that they can maybe figure out lives alone? As the canvas continues, officers notice someone watching the activity around Margaret's house. I noticed a man outside smoking a cigarette, so I went out to make contact with him. This person ended up being David Clinkenbeard. He said that he used to live next door to Margaret. He kind of wanted to know what was going on. He said he was essentially canvassing the neighborhood looking for anything that was suspicious. David did strike me as odd at first. It was concerning to me that he was standing out there trying to determine what exactly we had found. As David continues to talk, police grow increasingly suspicious. He was kind of making comments about information that seemed strange that he would know about. He knew details of where Margaret was found and in what state she was found. Having people know how she was found and even what she was wearing is very suspicious. You don't know where someone has gotten their information. Were they there? Were they involved in the murder? With a growing list of questions about David, Officers approached Margaret's neighbors for answers. One of the uh, neighbors had mentioned how they had seen David driving through the neighborhood, but didn't stop, just kind of drove through. So they thought that was kind of strange. Maybe he's come back to the scene of a crime, whether he's driving back by because he knows what he did and he's having remorse, or maybe trying to get back inside there to get her body out of there and get rid of it, or to look to see if he left anything behind. 
David told some of the neighbors that his fingerprints would be all over the house and he would have to get his fingerprints taken, which is not something that people usually say or think. The next day, David's appearance in local news coverage of the murder raises further alarm bells. I turned on the news and there he is on TV, talking to the reporters, putting himself out there. Was this a guilty man's ploy to hide in plain sight? That seemed out of sorts to us. Generally, when people are grieving a loss, their instinct is not to cooperate with the media. But David seemed very willing to speak with them. All of these things added together are possible indicators of someone who is purposely trying to insert themselves in the investigation because they're involved in this investigation. Could David have possibly been involved in Margaret's murder? At that point, we had some questions about his actions and his knowledge of how Margaret was found. He definitely became a main point of interest. On April 11th, two days after finding Margaret's body in her own home, police bring her former neighbor, David Clinkenbeard, in for questioning. David told us that he last saw Margaret when he was helping her with her trash can on Wednesday. You didn't come by on Thursday or Friday, not Sunday. Not Sunday. On Sunday, he had gone over to the house and he didn't locate her. He had some concerns that maybe she was upstairs in a state of undress and he didn't want to go up there himself. So he contacted Jan across the street. And that's when you had Jan come over in case she was upstairs and not not decent. Yeah, Jan went up there and she wasn't up there. And then we go to the closet up there. Okay, your friend's missing. That'd be the last thing in your mind, whether they're dressed or not, you would go and look for them throughout the entire house, not go get somebody else. As the interview continues, David's answers only raise further suspicion. She likes to look nice. And she was a pretty woman. Yeah. When she was younger, she was a redhead. Oh. Yeah. And she was really unlike anything else I've ever seen. She was kind of like, not thin, thin, but, you know, I mean, I was trying to be hot because she looked like him. Some of the comments that he made about Margaret, in particular her physical appearance when she was younger, she had just been murdered, and here he is describing her figure and her body type in an interview. The detective asked David about the calls he made when he couldn't find Margaret. Oh, I want to get my cell phone call out because I got this number on my phone. Do you have your phone with you? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Would you mind if I had my computer guy just go through and write down the dates on your phone? He said he must have left it at home and didn't have it on his person. It seems strange because, you know, in this day and age, nobody goes anywhere without their cell phone. Their cell phone is always on them. Investigators must now subpoena David's cell phone records. At the same time, they receive a forensics report from the crime scene. DNA belonging to Margaret was found on the glove that was discovered outside of Margaret's house. We believe that the suspect's DNA was on the inside of the glove. Would you mind if I, I would be able to get a, a sample of your DNA? We know you're supposed to be in the house. Would that be okay with you? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Detectives send David's DNA to compare against that found inside the glove. While they wait for the results, they checked David's cell phone data to verify his alibi. We were able to go through his day-to-day life and see that he likely was not involved, but there was no concrete evidence that we were able to bring to light. Unlike the phone records, the DNA findings are conclusive. David is not Margaret's killer. David ended up being, in the end of all this thing, just a friend of hers uh, that was not involved at all. Sometimes he would say things that didn't really have an explanation. It just took the time and the effort to understand his involvement, and there was reasonable explanation for all of the things that we had concerns about. He just really cared about Margaret and really had concern that he would have an answer as to what happened. We had to look at David as prior number one interest because obviously his strange comments in the beginning about his DNA and fingerprints, plus he's the one that saw her on a regular basis. 
up until that point where you reach a crossroads, you really do have to look at every tiny detail, every possibility. Detectives turn their attention to the autopsy report, which paints a terrifying picture of Margaret's last moments. The medical examiner's report on Margaret showed what kind of force was used to uh, kill her in the end. She had contusions to her head, to her face. She had a fracture to her orbital socket. She had a, uh, a fracture to her C7 vertebrae in her neck. It showed there was a compression there, which broke her neck. Margaret was not a frail woman. Not just anyone would be able to manually strangle her. While the autopsy finds no direct evidence of sexual assault, officers continue to suspect otherwise. Why would her underwear be ripped off of her? They weren't like pulled off, they were torn. There were other bodily fluids that were mixed in with the swabs from Margaret's body. The fact that someone took Margaret in such a horrific manner was a very difficult thing to handle. As homicide detectives regroup to search for new leads, patrol officers alert them to an unusual crime reported in the early morning hours of April 8th, the day before Margaret's body is discovered. There was a report of a carjacking very near the scene of Margaret Douglas' home. In a community like Wadsworth, we don't have carjackings. That's not a normal call for us. They happened in such time close to one another that we had to wonder if they were related. The carjacking victim is a local man named Paul Shalot. Paul had reported he was driving along and he happened to notice a 19, 20 year old man limping, like having trouble walking up the street. Paul had reported to us that he was just being a good Samaritan and picking somebody up that he thought to be injured. So as he went out to help him, he said the uh, gentleman just slid into the driver's seat and then locked the doors and wouldn't let him in and took off with his car. Officers grow suspicious when they quickly locate Paul's car near the site of the carjacking. The car was found very quickly and it was found right there in the same area it was taken. Literally, like, not even a block away from where he had picked this gentleman up, supposedly, and lost his car. This happened at a building that had cameras on the outside, so we wanted to kind of investigate Paul's story because it just didn't seem quite right. You could see on the video that Paul had been with what appeared to be a young man. The young man was not limping. He did not seem to be injured in any way. Paul's initial report did not match anything that video said. It just wasn't adding up. He was not being honest and something else was going on. Why had Paul lied to police? And who was the young man seen in security footage? Had one of them gone on to do something unthinkable? We had the carjacking and then we had Mark's disappearance. It just started making me think a little bit. Could this be the guy that could be involved? Police investigating the murder of 98-year-old Margaret Douglas have a potential new lead after learning of an alleged carjacking in her quiet neighborhood. Somebody that's willing to perpetrate a crime such as a carjacking makes you really wonder, is this related to a murder that's just happened a couple blocks away? But when security video proves the victim, Paul Shalot, has lied to police, detectives demand answers. When I interviewed Paul to get the whole story, he was very nervous, and then he finally started telling us the truth about um, how he came to be in that area and what really happened. He was on a, an app trying to meet somebody, and he did uh, come across somebody. He said he worked for a church, and he didn't want them to find out that he's using a, a site to try to meet up with young men. He didn't want to admit it right away, but they started getting involved sexually in the car. The male subject he picked up, I guess, started getting upset that things weren't going his way. The young man that he met up with just kind of snapped and took the car. Not what Paul had expected when he met this person online. With Paul finally being honest, detectives change course and ask if he knows anything about the murder of Margaret Douglas. 
he was aware of what had happened and that she was a victim of a homicide. But Paul did not know Margaret at all. He had no ties to her and real no ties even in that neighborhood. He was just there basically to meet up with somebody that night. And I started thinking, well, now we need to know who was driving that car, who carjacked him. Paul was asked for the account information for the app that he used to meet this person on. He said he couldn't remember the email he used or the password he used to get in there. Paul was embarrassed about what he had let happen and the fact that he was involved with a young man. He had deleted everything from his phone that was relative to that. We weren't able to recover any of that information. So we had no way of proving or figuring out who it was that he may have met up with that night. After hitting another dead lead, frustrated investigators know that public fear is only growing. There was definitely some fear. There were people that would normally stroll down the street, walk their dogs, let their kids play outside unsupervised, and things like that weren't happening after Margaret's discovery. And the emotions for everybody were really high and, and heightened. They're all locking their doors now, and they're really watching for everything. So it was definitely a shock to all of them. With the community on edge, Margaret's family continues to struggle with their loss. The hardest part going through all this is the time consuming and the worrying and the waiting for the outcome and you're not sure what's going to happen. That was hard. You know, none of us are patient and we all want to know what happened here, why someone would do this. The reason you're doing what you're doing is for the victim. You want somebody to be held responsible for what they've done. Believing that the carjacker may be a serial criminal, police take a closer look at the petty crimes reported around Margaret's neighborhood. The crimes all took place in just a few block area. Is there somebody in this neighborhood that's committing a whole bunch of crimes for some reason because we weren't seeing those crimes spreading out throughout the city like we typically would? You have to wonder if the person who's committing these petty crimes has escalated to commit something more horrific. On the night of April 13th, four days after the discovery of Margaret's body, police received several calls about two young men. We had received a lot of different calls where people had seen two male subjects running around, creating mischief, doing things at the park, doing things at the church, and in cars. A couple of young males were taking some type of device that had wheels on the bottom and hanging out in one of the parking lots. That same night, police respond to a call that changes everything. It was reported to us that there had been a break-in to a trailer that was at a construction site. When officers investigate, they get a huge break. Someone had left their cell phone behind at the trailer. Does the phone belong to the person responsible for the neighborhood crime spree, including Margaret's murder? Investigators use forensic software to unlock the phone. The phone came back to a subject that we had been known in our area for different car break-ins and little thefts from cars that uh, happened in our city and especially over in that area. He was identified by one of our officers as Zach Franz. Zach was known to us, and he did have a troubled past. He had been in some more serious trouble, and we were all familiar with him. At this point, we thought that we really needed to bring Zach in and talk to him about what he had been doing that night. Zach was found sleeping in his car at the high school in the parking lot. As officers bring Zach into the station for an interview, something immediately catches their attention. Zach had some scratches on his legs, which made me wonder where those came from. Are they defensive wounds from somebody fighting back against you and scratching you that way? Could they be from something simple, explainable, or evidence into what we were looking into with regards to Margaret Douglas? investigating the murder of Margaret Douglas have connected local teen Zach Thronson to a spate of crimes near her home. With the carjacking, we know there was supposed to be a young male. Now we have Zach running around, committing these little crimes all within the same area around the same time frame. 
his phone was left behind at the trailer, so we knew for sure that he was involved in the crimes that were all seemingly tied together. Detectives cut to the chase and ask Zach if he killed Margaret Douglas. Zach, uh, you know, he owned up for the little things he did, but he denied any knowledge of it or being involved at all. Detectives steer the interview to the identity of the teen seen with Zach in security footage. He said that he was out with his friend Gavin Ramsey and that everything that had happened was all Gavin's idea. Gavin had been the one that was trying to break into the trailer and that he was just standing by and, and watching it happen. Just a presence during the time that Gavin was committing all the other petty crimes. Zach was definitely distancing himself, so there was some concern that he wasn't being honest about everything that they had done. For the moment, police decide not to charge Zach until they interview his friend, Gavin Ramsey. Gavin had been in trouble before, and his mom had dealt with that. She was going to help hold him accountable for the things he had done. We talked about the trailer, and I just let him know that we knew he was there because Zach had told us that he was there. Property-type crimes and less serious crimes is what we talked about at first. That's just to see, is he going to own up to that? And then we'd continue from there into something more serious. You guys didn't take anything? Did you rummage through glove boxes or anything? Maybe like 50 times, but I, other than that, seriously nothing. He admitted to all of them. He would rifle through cars and take things that weren't of a lot of value just to take things. Gavin Pearls during the interview, he does it for a rush. So it wasn't about money or anything. I think the reason that he was so willing to admit to these lesser offenses is to kind of distance himself and clear his name from anything else I might want to talk to him about. Now, detectives turn their questions to more serious crimes. We had a carjacking. Oh my God. And the suspect is a young white male with a nice complexion and blue eyes. Is that you? Gavin's demeanor changed substantially when I started to ask him about the carjacking. Thank you so much. There's something else you need to tell us? You've already gotten yourself in trouble, so... I know, and I don't mean... I don't know what to say. Before answering further questions, Gavin asks to speak with a detective alone. I don't think you two would actually be present. What's that? So I didn't talk to her. Yeah. So when his mom stepped out, the car thing, it okay, it was me. I'm gonna be honest about it, but the way that he explained it, that guy, that's not right. Like it was just he openly admitted that he was the one who did the carjacking, but he didn't really want to talk about the sexual part of what happened in there. You guys didn't talk about what kind of sex you were going to have, or... No, I mean, I don't know, it's not something I'm interested in, just the act of him getting the payback. I guess, I don't know, that's, like, it's karma, really. Like, if you're going to do that, then I'm going to rob you. Gavin denies that... He was truly interested in meeting up with Paul for any reason other than to catfish him or to teach him a lesson. This is a kid that's admitting to going around, breaking into cars, and it's not for theft, it's for a rush, so we know he's after the adrenaline. What else could he have possibly done? With Gavin admitting to the carjacking, the interview turns to questions about Margaret Douglas. I specifically asked him, if he had murdered Margaret, and he denied it. So we, there's no reason that we would find your DNA inside her house, because we swapped the hell out of that house. Are you sure? I mean, if you've never been in there, then obviously you wouldn't. But, I mean, you name it. We yeah. swapped it, we took it. I'm sure you know we were there all night. Yeah. He was hiding something. There was more to be said. I didn't feel that this avenue had been exhausted with him. This was something that we probably needed to revisit, maybe from another direction. For now, 
Detectives allow Gavin to leave with his mother. At this point, we have nothing other than the petty crimes, which are handled through juvenile court, so we wouldn't actually take him into custody to hold him. But they have one request for Gavin's mother. I let her know that we had concerns and that I would like to look at his phone. I was expecting to find information about how maybe Gavin was victimized. Instead, what officers find on Gavin's phone changes everything. Officer Cooper discovered Google-type searches, murder in Wadsworth, Margaret Douglas investigation, Wadsworth PD reports on homicide investigation. Then, detectives find something they never would have imagined. There were actually photos and videos of Margaret Douglas. Timestamps show that the images were recorded in the early morning hours of Friday, April 6th. She obviously didn't know he was there, and he was just photographing her from a vantage point in her own home. There was clearly a point in time where she realized that someone was in her home and was startled. Nothing can prepare investigators for what they see next. I was absolutely shocked that a child could imagine doing this to another human being. This wasn't a horror movie. This was actually happening. Detectives investigating the murder of 98-year-old Margaret Douglas have found disturbing evidence on a phone belonging to 17-year-old Gavin Ramsey. The first thought in my mind was, he knows we're going to discover this. And I could just imagine him fleeing. Police moved quickly to take Gavin into custody. Once we picked him up, I briefly told his mom that we had discovered evidence on his phone and that we were going to take him back to the police department. It was definitely not the easiest interview that I had ever done. I came up onto the porch, and I didn't even know what I was going to do. I don't know, I felt like going into the house is like the biggest adrenaline rush I could get. So... And I tried the door not a minute. That just happened to be unlocked. He was videotaping her while she slept, stalking his victim like an animal stalks its prey. So how long do you think you were in the house before you woke her up? I don't know, probably like 10, 15 minutes. You could see in some of the photos the obvious horror on her face as to what was happening. And then from the time you woke her up to the time you ended up on top of her, so gonna, how long did that whole part take? Oh, probably like five minutes. He had used both hands to squeeze her neck and push her neck back against the floor, strangling her. He said that once he realized the gravity of what he was doing, it was too late that she was already gone. For officers, the most disturbing questions involve what Gavin did after killing Margaret. When I saw him, it was just like, this is sick. This is not a normal murder. The sexual nature of his actions was kind of a topic that he was not willing to talk about. He degraded her by using her for sexual things and videotaping and taking pictures. He'd actually been in there with her for a while. And then I checked my phone and it said it was like four something. And I knew my mom shouldn't get up at five for work. So he takes the body, finds the closet, because he has to get home. He throws in there to hide her because I don't want anybody to find her. I don't want anybody to know it's me. But was Margaret simply a random victim of Gavin's need for a rush? Or had he known her better than he'd initially let on? Gavin lived very close to Margaret Douglas, right around the corner from her house. 
Gavin had actually been to her house before, asking her about maybe cutting her grass, raking leaves, or even you know shoveling snow. He was out looking for little odd jobs around the neighborhood. The thought in the back of my mind was that Gavin had observed Margaret regularly and actually thought about the things that he would like to do and that she would make a good victim. Police arrest Gavin Ramsey for the murder of Margaret Douglas and get a search warrant for his bedroom. We found gloves matching the same style and type of glove that was found at the scene. In one of his drawers, I discovered Margaret's red wallet. Detectives then make an even more disturbing find. We also found a journal that had some writings about fantasies about murder. He had written almost like a book report on different serial killers. After reading those, there was no doubt in my mind that Gavin would kill again if he had the opportunity. This is something that he enjoys and he finds pleasure in. This is somebody that's ultimately going to be a serial killer if he's not caught. Because of the heinous nature of the crime, the juvenile penal system is not equipped to deal with an individual such as Gavin Ramsey. Gavin was ultimately charged as an adult with aggravated murder, two other counts of murder, burglary, and abuse of a corpse. We requested that Mr. Ramsey receive the harshest penalty that the law would allow. Found guilty on all charges, Gavin is sentenced to life in prison without parole for the murder of Margaret Douglas. When I watched Gavin Ramsey uh, at the sentencing, I still felt in my mind that he doesn't understand the gravity of what he's done. There's still no remorse there. You would like to think that the world is full of people like you and I and don't want to think that of such a young person able to act out something that you would only see in a horror movie. I was shocked to find out that it was a young person who was still in high school that would do something like this. To murder somebody who's 98 years old, to think you could shove a body in that closet, I, I just, that part, I, I just can't even. It absolutely made me think of my own grandma. I just could not imagine her living such a wonderful life and having it end in such a horrific way. Despite the horror of Margaret's death, her family honors her memory by thinking of her remarkable life. Margaret gave you an inspiration that you can still be 98 years old and be very functional, live in your own home, take care of yourself. She, to me, was just an inspiration. She led a full life and could have been longer. Margaret would want to be remembered as the person who took care of herself, cared about those around her, and was willing to do what she needed to do. My aunt was Margaret Douglas, and she was a wonderful woman. She was a great woman. A woman devoted to her town. She was the deputy county treasurer away from the courthouse. You saw a different person. She loved to dance. life snuffed out in a savage attack. There was quite a bit of blood. She had been beaten pretty severely. She had to have been terrified. She struggled at the end of her life. She had no enemies. Nobody had a clue who would do something like that. Police investigate several troubling theories. Is it a close friend that got into an argument with her? There had been some shouting matches. Maybe she interrupted a burglary or a theft. After months of false leads and dead ends, the town was on high alert. A stunning discovery breaks open the case. It added a new twist to the crime. 
all of a sudden you realize, maybe I don't know all my neighbors. And points to a murderer in their midst. I was kind of speechless at first. I thought, my gosh. I mean, you just can't believe it. The tiny farming community of Colon, Nebraska is one of the smallest towns in America with a population of just over 100 people. Colon, Nebraska is a very laid-back community, very close-knit family is there. I think that if you went there, you'd drive through and you go, oh, this is small. <laughs> Many people would leave their doors unlocked, their cars unlocked, keys left in the ignition, just to feel of safety, that there's no threat. But then, on June 30th, 2003, police receive a distressing call. Around 6.42 in the evening, dispatch indicated to me that they had received a report of a possible suicide. My friend ended up finding her body across the street in her garage, uh, along with a gun. He had called 911, and it was reported as a suicide. Once I arrived, the firemen on scene already were pointing me to a garage. I walked in and could see the body of a white female that was laying on the ground. There was quite a bit of blood and there was disfigurement to the head and face area so we could not recognize the victim. A black handgun was found near her head. There is so much blood on the scene investigators aren't able to determine the cause of death and need to wait for an autopsy to be sure. The small black handgun didn't actually contain bullets and we didn't find any shell casings in the area. The car had a smear on the driver's side and then I did find that there was a smear of what appeared to be blood on the walk-in door that went out the side of the garage. There was also what looked like blood spatter, where someone stepped in the pool of blood. There was a footprint impression that was taken that indicated that there was a second person there. This was a suspicious death. There were DNA swabs taken on her body and of her clothing that she was wearing at the time. We noticed that her purse was located underneath her vehicle. Was this just a uh, botched burglary, or did the person have some other intention? From the personal items in her purse, police identify the victim as 66-year-old Sharon Erickson. Sharon was very well known. It was shocking to us as law enforcement to see somebody that was a fixture in the community being the victim in this case. Born and raised in Nebraska's farm country, Sharon Erickson was a lifelong government worker. Sharon worked across the hall from me. She was the deputy county treasurer. She was excellent, very honest. I would put her against anybody in the state of Nebraska for knowledge when it comes to the office of the treasurer. She would do anything for you, gosh darn. When it came to the office or anything, she was always attendant and very, very helpful, always. In 1998, after 37 years of devoted service, Sharon retired. Away from the courthouse, you saw a different person, more relaxed. She loved to dance, and if anyone wanted to dance, boom, she was on the dance floor. <laughs> and boy, she was so good at dancing. I'm telling you what, boy, she could dance every dance until they'd shut the music off. As a single woman, Sharon lived alone, but saw the people of Colon as her family. People used to go to the bar and have coffee. Well, that one closed. Sharon came over and she says, I have a little front room in my house there. Would you come and remodel it and paint it for me? She had me fix that room up and gave the locals a key for coffee. It had a coffee pot in there. It was just somewhere where they could go. She didn't charge them. That's the type of person that you're talking about. Police are at a loss when they realize Sharon was attacked just 50 feet away from the gathering spot she gifted to the town. Who could have wanted to kill her and why? 
Detectives expand their search for evidence to Sharon's home. She lived in what used to be a grocery store and had converted to her house. The other odd thing about Sharon's residence is that her garage was located across her house. And so to get to her car, she would have to walk out the front of her house and across Main Street. What or who could have lured Sharon out of her home and to her death in the garage? That we did find some damage to the back door that appeared to be consistent with some forced entry. There was a cold chisel that was found uh, next to the door that more than likely was used. We also did find that the phone line had been cut. There was at least some planning on the attack. Someone was obviously trying to prevent her from calling for help. Inside, there was nothing out of place. When we started going room by room, we found that there was a holster for a small gun in her bedroom near the bed, and the gun was missing. That, along with her bed not being made and the back door having damage and being pried open, we started to have a a picture in our minds that this may have occurred in the middle of the night. Our assumption was that there was a burglary. She was alerted to the burglary because of noise coming from the person prying on the back door, that she got up out of bed, grabbed her gun, and went to investigate what was occurring before she was killed. As investigators continue to process the scene, they are interrupted by volunteer firefighter and village postmaster Rick Hartman. He was friends with Sharon. He actually was the one that found her body. Mr. Hartman appeared to be a little more interested in the situation than some of the other firefighters that were there. Mr. Hartman had to be asked on several different occasions to stay behind the crime scene tape. After it kept happening, it really alerted a lot of us to, why does he keep doing this? Is there something else going on? Is there something wrong? Rick's behavior makes officers immediately suspicious, so they approach him for an interview on site. During the interview, Mr. Hartman had indicated that he was really close friends with Sharon. When Sharon would leave town, she would leave a key in her post office box for him to check on her house. So he was trusted by her. Sharon would come visit him every day when she'd come pick up her mail. But Rick tells police he didn't see Sharon that morning. He was asked to check on her after a worried relative didn't hear from Sharon that evening. Rick Hartman, he had gone looking for Sharon. Sharon was nowhere to be found. Mr. Hartman opened the garage door and you could see Sharon laying beside her car. Without prompting, he indicated that it was a suicide, that she had a gun, knew how to use it. But we were very confident that there was foul play involved. When Rick is asked to make a formal statement, his demeanor abruptly changes. He said, if you're going to arrest me, arrest me. Otherwise, I'm leaving. I was taken aback. Why would he say that? Why would he do that? We need to look a little harder at this person and find out what that was all about. Coming up, new evidence reveals a disturbing detail. She had been sexually assaulted. I was definitely shocked. Small town gossip sparks salacious rumors. There may have been more than just a friendship there. He was trying to hide additional evidence. And just when detectives think they have the killer in their sights... It had to be him. A startling truth is revealed. It sent shockwaves through the entire area. I went, what? You've got to be kidding me. Police investigating the murder of Sharon Erickson are speaking to her close friend, Rick Hartman. But when they ask him for a statement, Rick suddenly ends the interview. He was upset that he couldn't leave and finally just told the investigators that 
I'm going to leave, and if you want to arrest me, go ahead and arrest me. That was pretty out of character and uncharacteristic for somebody who had a friend that was just killed. So that immediately caused investigators some concern. The statements and odd behavior really pointed us in a direction towards the postmaster. Mr. Hartman gave his alibi. He was at home with his family, and that was confirmed by his wife. Rick never had any criminal record or had done anything wrong, so there wasn't a great deal of focus on him any more than anybody else. Rick's on the back burner for now, but investigators will keep him in their sights. We didn't want to rule anybody out specifically, but we wanted to cast a wide net. While investigators consider their next move, news of the murder, the first one in 40 years, travels fast. The town of Colon was buzzing. I got calls, bang, bang, bang. I can't remember who called first. I went, what? That's all I got, and I just was dumbfounded. I mean, I just couldn't believe it. When you hear of someone that you know and you knew for 25, 30 years, it's devastating. Everyone's just shaking their heads saying, how can this happen? How can this happen? Sharon's death was a big loss for our community. She had known so many people through her work, through her friends, and to not have her in the community anymore, that always creates a hole. Everybody spoke well of her. She was beloved by the people in the community. We didn't know where to start looking, so we tried to determine anything potentially that could have happened. Is it a close friend that got into an argument with her? Is it a neighbor that maybe didn't like her? The day after the murder, police canvassed Sharon's neighborhood. They questioned almost everybody that knew Sharon about, have you heard anything? Do you have any information that can help us? And I said, I have no idea, no idea. She had no enemies. Nobody had a clue who would do something like that. It has to be someone that we don't know. I mean, it has to be someone that came from town. While we don't have a lot of violent crime in the area, there was definitely one family that lived right behind Sharon that came to mind as somebody that could have been concerning. The investigators had made contact with uh, Jim Mars. He was an individual that would get into trouble here and there. He wasn't real responsible. He associated with people that were involved in minor crimes, such as burglaries, drug use. I asked what his relationship with Sharon was, and basically it was just an acquaintance. Mr. Mars would see her occasionally outside of her house when he was going to the post office or on Main Street. They would say hi. He said he got in trouble by her a couple times for mischief when he was younger, and she would yell at him. When we interviewed Jim Mars, he didn't know anything about Sharon's death, and he was so sorry that she died. Jim had been in Kansas doing a roofing job. After he got back from Kansas, he eventually uh, went to Wahoo, drank some beer with a friend, attempted to go to another bar. At that time, it was after closing time, and he drove the back roads home to Colon. He estimated he got home about 1.30 in the morning. Stayed up, watched TV, drank a pop, and then eventually went to bed. His mom confirmed the time that he came home. Everything seemed to be okay with his story. Investigators don't know the exact time of Sharon's death, so the 24-year-old remains on the suspect list. Before police leave, Jim gives them a tip. Jim had indicated that there was a trucker that always had interactions and always seemed to be bickering with Miss Erickson. The truck driver may have parked a little bit on her property and she'd get upset about it. He might have his engine running on his truck and it would bother her. She would bring it to his attention and he would not necessarily comply with her request. It was no secret the two didn't get along. We were gaining information from friends that Sharon had had disputes with this man. 
Detectives must now determine if a run-in with the trucker turned fatal. A lot of the community members felt that the truck driver was doing things to antagonize her and to cause more problems between them. That was something that was public because there had been some shouting matches, some vocal exchanges about the fact that this truck was running all night. Some of the people in the community who knew that he wasn't overly fond with Sharon, they kind of rumored him to be a suspect. Maybe the frustration amongst the two had just finally boiled over. It just seemed suspicious. I know the investigators had attempted to reach out to the uh, truck driver in question and weren't able to contact him. Police do all they can, but can't track down the driver's whereabouts. Today's technology is there's cameras everywhere. Uh, You're using your cell phone. At the time of this homicide, that kind of technology wasn't prevalent. We didn't know if we were going to find that person. Is Sharon Erickson's murderer on the run? That's concerning, and that was on the minds of probably all the citizens in this area. And probably the scariest thing for law enforcement in the community is, is that person likely to offend again? Police hunting the killer of 66-year-old Sharon Erickson have a new suspect, a truck driver she had clashed with several times. Had something escalated from vocal argument to some other level. Now, detectives fear the trucker has fled the area. We went door to door, asked people if they saw the truck driver. No one had any information about him, and it didn't appear we were any further along than we were the night we got there. And. The town was on high alert. There was a murderer out there. It's hard to cop the play. Hard to cop the play. A week after Sharon's murder, detectives received the autopsy results. The report did indicate that the death would have occurred sometime, uh, most likely that night or the early morning hours of the day that she was found. The medical examiner indicated that there was no gunshot wounds, that the gun had not been used in the commission of the crime. The pathologist ruled the cause of death to be asphyxiation along with blunt force trauma. It was found that Sharon had been beaten pretty severely. She had also been strangled. She also suffered some broken ribs and had some defensive wounds on her hands from fighting off her attacker. The autopsy contains one more disturbing detail. She had a small vaginal tear as well, which indicated that she'd been sexually assaulted. I was definitely shocked that there was a sexual assault involved. Totally unexpected. It added a new twist to the crime, which further led to more questions. It really makes you feel for the victim. She had to have been terrified for those few minutes that she struggled at the end of her life. During the autopsy, her underwear were taken for possible examination for DNA, this being pretty early in the DNA process in the early 2000s. We waited. Two days later, on July 10th, the trucker is back in town and police bring him in for questioning. He's not overly cooperative. He was reluctant to give any details about where he was, what he was doing. Detectives pressed the trucker on his relationship with Sharon. The truck driver wouldn't have called Sharon a friend. He felt irritated by the way she would overreact, I believe is how he he termed it. He did not have a good relationship with her. But the truck driver vows he's no killer. He told us he was out of town at the time of the homicide. He was in Wyoming or Colorado. He was hundreds of miles away and had receipts to prove it. Officers were sent off to corroborate the receipt. He was asked for a DNA sample and a polygraph, and he refused. Was the trucker hiding something? It's just one of the things that you can add to a list of items that if there's too many on that list, it's a problem. 
With nothing concrete linking the trucker to the homicide, detectives have to let him go. Law enforcement officers were in the process of interviewing and chasing down alibis. We had been following up with people, but there was not a lot of new information coming in and not a lot of credible information. With Sharon's murder still unsolved, the community remains on high alert. Before this happened, it was probably one of the safest places you'd want to be. Everyone's on their toes. You know, you drive up, you, you lock your car, you lock your house, you watch everything. Here's a lady that just retired, 60-some years old. Who could do this? It just was a shock to the whole county. As a community, you want resolution, or you at least want to know why it happened and how can we get some justice out of this. Although the entire town is mourning the loss of Sharon, Rick Hartman seems to be taking an unnaturally keen interest in the investigation. Rick would ask us about what we were doing about other leads, and then he would insert his thoughts. His behavior was a little more pushy, trying to get uh, as much information as Rick could. Is this just a concerned friend who wants to see how the investigation's going, or is there something more to than that? Despite his odd behavior, Rick still has a solid alibi, and the investigation stalls. We decided that we all needed to get back together and just have like a, a brainstorm session and say, what do we do? The, one of the things that we talked about is at the time of the homicide, uh, in early 2000s, meth had been a problem. People would steal anhydrous ammonia from tanks and then use that to create their own methamphetamine. Some of these people were heavy addicts, very dangerous, and involved in a lot of crimes. One of the things that was being discussed with the anhydrous tanks was they were not too far from Sharon's home. So could she have seen something? Could she have spotted something, said something to make someone believe that she knew who they were and what they were doing? Did Sharon confront them? Did they attack her to keep her quiet? We might be looking for somebody who's manufacturing and selling methamphetamine who may have been in colon on that particular night. Five weeks after Sharon Erickson is savagely beaten to death, detectives investigate whether she had been killed by a criminal gang manufacturing illegal drugs near her home. It's an easy target, no cameras in that area. We were aware that Sharon kept an eye on Main Street. She a lot of times had information about suspicious people, something going on after hours there. Sharon was one that if she saw something that she didn't think was right, she wasn't afraid to stand up and say something. Maybe she saw something that she shouldn't have. She interrupted a burglary or a theft. As we talked to people around town, they also indicated that that might have been one of the reasons why Sharon may have been murdered. Investigators had talked to local suspects who were involved in the manufacturing of methamphetamine. People that we had arrested previous to this incident, and then people from the metro areas, most of them have pretty extensive criminal records, and they're heavily addicted. So the level of cooperation with somebody who's addicted to methamphetamine is not going to be very good. It creates a, a difficult picture to paint. We were not able to generate the type of evidence or leads that we really would hope for. We as a department were frustrated with things not happening real fast and the way that you always want. The canvas fails to yield the information police were looking for, as does the investigation into the trucker. As the investigation unfolded, the truck driver was eliminated. He was miles and miles away from the incident. We contacted the establishment where he got fuel, and it wasn't a phony receipt. With this, the driver is fully off the suspect list. 
After doing the first set of interviews and looking at potential suspects, the investigators really weren't able to focus on anybody that would be so mad or somebody that would want to sexually assault Sharon or to kill her. So it, it kind of left a lot of question marks. Where do you go? What do you look for? Um, there's just a lot of unknowns. We just don't know what's going on. Do we feel safe or do we need to worry? Everybody had their ideas who did this, and I think it just kept going and going and going. People didn't have a clue, but they wanted to talk about it. There was a lot of discussion amongst the community members as to what was going on. A lot of rumors floating around. One of these rumors that starts circulating has to do with one of Sharon's good friends and a familiar name to detectives. Because of Rick's close contact with Sharon, small town rumors begin to surface that there may have been more than just a friendship there. Many of the community members had mentioned rumors that Rick Hartman and Sharon had been having an affair. We start to wonder, was there more to their friendship, maybe in a romantic way? There was talk. This was something that was being discussed. So it's not that hard of a thought process or big of a leap to say, could he be involved? Police talked to Rick again, this time at the sheriff's office. He was cooperative. He somehow, I think, liked the attention. But that changes when detectives ask Rick some very pointed questions. Law enforcement actually asked him if there was a romantic relationship between the two of them. He was immediately offended, and he denied that. Mr. Hartman appeared to be very distraught. He said he was just friends with her, that there was no romantic relationship. Could the sexual assault that appeared in Sharon's autopsy actually have been a consensual encounter with Rick? That question certainly seems accusatory. Those things are not comfortable, but that comes with the job. You got to do your job. Rick was questioned in detail and really scrutinized on where he was what his involvement was. There were a number of times he said, we got to look somewhere else because we we're wasting our time on him. He became agitated and wanted to go home. Rick stands by the alibi he gave police back when they first questioned him seven weeks ago at the crime scene. Rick was home with his wife at the time that we believe Sharon was killed. The investigators went and corroborated his story with his wife again. We really had no reason to believe that Rick's wife would not disclose if he were gone at that time. Even though there were a lot of things that kind of pointed to him, he had a pretty good alibi. With no hard evidence against Rick, detectives have to let him go, but not before getting one thing. We collected DNA from Mr. Hartman. We talked a little about it, and he says, but Don, I didn't do it. But again, you always have that doubt, you know, what happened? There was just speculation and suspicion. Two months after Sharon's murder, detectives finally received results from the forensics lab. They had tried to do analysis on some of the items which were collected at autopsy to come up with a DNA profile. Will this be the break detectives have been hoping for? We were really needing something such as that to come through for us. after the murder of Sharon Erickson. Police hope the DNA results they've been waiting for will confirm who they suspect is her killer. There was quite a bit of speculation that it could be the postmaster in town. We were contacted by our state patrol lab. They believed that there was something there, but that they could not separate out a complete profile for comparison. It was kind of frustrating to know that there may be something there, but that maybe it was a dead end that we couldn't get past. Without a DNA match, we as investigators knew that if that was the case, it would be very hard to solve this crime. But detectives aren't giving up. The Nebraska Medical Center could test smaller quantities than the State Patrol Lab could do. 
So we made a determination that we would take our evidence and send it in to the other lab and have more DNA testing done. Results will take months to come back. And with a killer still on the loose, nerves in small town Colon, Nebraska, begin to fray. When the investigation went on and on and on, I thought, come on, we've got to find something. We had a murder back in 69 or 68 that was never solved in Wahoo. And of course, right away, you think, gosh, we got to find out who did this. Could it be someone we do know? There can be a mistrust. All of a sudden, you realize, mm, maybe I don't know all my neighbors. Then, police receive an unexpected tip that points back to the man they can't seem to rule out. The estate of Sharon Erickson had a garage sale, and Rick Hartman was at the garage sale. Uh, Mr. Hartman went in and purchased her mattress, and that was suspicious to us. If there was uh, some sort of a... Uh, maybe DNA evidence or something that would be on the mattress that would be of interest to law enforcement by somebody purchasing that and maybe getting rid of it, then it would be something that we would no longer be able to go back and utilize at a later time. Did he want the mattress because they did have potential sexual activity on the mattress? Maybe he was out there trying to hide additional evidence. Every time the investigators seemed to close a loophole with Mr. Hartman, something else happened. He kept drawing attention to him. It was just another thing that brought him back on radar. Law enforcement asked him about his attendance there and what he bought. He actually denied that he bought her mattress. So then that caused law enforcement some concern on why would you buy it? Okay, why, if you did buy it, why would you lie about it? Mr. Hartman agreed to undergo a polygraph, so he cooperated in that aspect, but he seemed nervous, on edge, jittery. The results from that polygraph were inconclusive. It left a lot of questions unanswered. It just added a little fuel to the fire. Every chance that we could get that he could clear his name seemed to be something that elevated him to the next level. The people in town were thinking it had to be him and were scared to go to the post office. In a small community where pretty much everybody knows everybody, it's easy to point fingers, it's easy to, to cast doubts. I golfed with Rick Hartman that week at our golf league and he was just nervous, he was just edgy and just scared. A number of us may have felt like Mr. Hartman had acted inappropriately or suspiciously. We just didn't have enough to really push it over the top. There was nothing that we could charge him with. We had no evidence that he committed the crime other than he kept interjecting himself in the investigation. Detectives hope that definitive proof will come from the Medical Center Forensic Lab. The last piece that we didn't have back yet was the DNA evidence. We got a phone call and they were able to isolate a DNA profile. They actually located a sperm cell on her clothing, which was a positive breakthrough for us. The only person that it could have been from would have been the person that had sexually assaulted her and presumably killed her. We felt that there was more hope in solving this than we had had for quite a while because at least DNA is something that we can link to a specific person. Armed with this DNA profile, police immediately zero in on their top suspect. We did send in Rick Hartman's DNA. Came back not a match. Rick's name is finally cleared from the suspect list once and for all. Scientific evidence is what it is. It confirmed everything that he was telling us. There was no romantic relationship. We were focused on an individual that had absolutely nothing to do with the homicide. I apologize for any stress we caused him or his family. But if it wasn't Rick, then who killed Sharon? 
One of the big concerns that we had is that if this was a stranger that was maybe passing through town or someone completely not associated with the community or with uh, Sharon, that it potentially could go unsolved without any additional evidence uh, coming forward. Investigators are back to square one, but they come up with a new game plan. We try to determine who else should we go out and collect samples from, who else were potential suspects, who could have done this, and who would provide those samples so we can send them in and see if there's a match. It was just a matter of being able to find that one person out there in the world that that belonged to. We're trying to get that needle in a haystack. Ten months after Sharon's murder, in April 2004, police get the results of their DNA dragnet. The lab got a confirmation that they uh, had a match. We now know who killed Sharon. It was the breakthrough that we needed. It sent shockwaves through the entire area. Almost a year after the murder of Sharon Erickson, police have matched DNA from the crime scene to her killer. The DNA came back and it matched uh, Jim Mars. James lived near nearby to Sharon. He was one of the people that police talked to early on. Jim had known Sharon nearly all his life. He had helped her out when he was younger, doing some yard work or snow removal. I was kind of speechless at first because he had no problem providing his DNA to law enforcement. I was shocked to find out that uh, James Mars was the perpetrator. We had never seen that type of violence out of him. Once we had a DNA match with Jim, we needed to figure out where the holes in his alibi are. When we originally interviewed Jim Mars, he said he'd been out in a bar in Wahoo uh, and later went home. The bartender believed the timeline that Jim had given us uh, was fairly accurate. Jim's mother stands by her story, too. I think those alibis were solid, but they didn't cover him for the whole evening. What I think happened is he was home and left. He lived right across the back alley from Sharon's house. And even if he had been home, that doesn't mean he didn't leave his house. The determination was that we did have enough evidence to proceed with the arrest and prosecution of Jim. We went to his residence very early in the morning, and he answered the door, and we placed him under arrest. He was shocked that he was being arrested, that he was considered the suspect. Um, we brought him in to interview him. Police try to establish a motive. That was one of the unique things in this case, to find out and even just try to resolve that big why. Why would that even happen? He was reluctant to give any details. There were a number of times he said, I don't remember. He sobbed at times. He said he didn't have anything to do with it, denied that he had any involvement. When asked about the sexual assault, he stated that Sharon was an old lady and he wouldn't do that. And from that point on, he stated he wanted an attorney and we stopped our questioning. We had filed charges for first-degree homicide, sexual assault. News of his arrest hits the community hard. This was very unexpected. I thought, my gosh, something's wrong here. I mean, you just, you just can't believe it. I was hoping that they'd catch someone that I did not know the family. The reaction in town was split. There was definitely a thought that, oh, it couldn't have been him that did it. And then there were supporters that, well, we thought maybe it was him. While investigators are confident that DNA evidence will be enough to get a conviction, they get even more ammunition against Jim. We had at least uh, five inmates come forward with information that Mr. Mars had confessed to them. He struck her, strangled her, killed her. 
These inmates were going to testify against him, that he had confessed to them. With this information, investigators pieced together what happened the night of the murder. Jim was at the bar, like he said. He had a few too many drinks at some point. Went home. He wasn't able to sleep. From what he told the other inmates, he was uh, looking for some money. He thought Sharon may be an easy target. He was just going to burglarize her house. He climbed over Sharon's fence in the backyard, cut her phone line so she wouldn't be able to call anybody, pried her back door open, and ended up kicking the door in in order to go see if he could find her purse or find some money that was laying around. Once that back door was kicked in, Sharon woke up. He was confronted by Sharon, who was holding a gun and threatened to shoot him at that point if he didn't leave. Sharon went to call 911, and her phone line was dead. She kept her cell phone in her car for emergencies. Sharon ran across the street to get into her car. Jim chased her down, caught her, and ended up attacking her. He punched her and then eventually choked her to death. There was a sexual assault. He refused to talk to the inmates about that. Had he not sexually assaulted her and we didn't have any DNA, uh, we would never have it solved when you have a sperm cell that was a perfect match. There's nobody else that could be responsible. The chance of this being another person was out of this world. With the evidence we had, this was a slam dunk for his conviction. On August 15th, 2005, Jim Mars pleads guilty to second degree murder. He is sentenced to life with no possibility of parole. When I found out there was a sexual assault that went along with the slain, I was just furious. What kind of person would do something like this? You've got to be kidding me. And the community was appalled. I was happy that we finally got closure. He did it. He's locked up. Sharon was the one that suffered the ultimate loss. And that's what the investigators put in all those hours of work for and give her her last uh, voice. Sharon's presence is missed in Colin to this day. Do not have her in the community, that's tough. There's pain and sadness. Sharon loved her community. Yes, she did. She was very good to my kids and very good to me and my family. Really good lady. former school teacher and wife of a small town mayor. Charlotte was very compassionate about students and very well liked. She was a wonderful mother. Found murdered in her home. It inflamed the community because of how popular she was. Detectives find evidence of a violent struggle. She had been savagely attacked. You could see that her wrist was broke. Who would kill this loving wife and mother? There was nobody that you could think of that would want her dead. It's going to be one of those cases of a who done it. Suspicions run rampant in this small town. People are trying to help the police crack this case, but it's just all of these rumors and innuendo. Somebody that was at a party bragging about killing Charlie. He was spending money like it was going out of style. A lady reported that her boyfriend tried to strangle her. We're thinking that's a very good suspect. Police close in, but a public accusation upends the case. He gave a statement on live radio accusing him of the murder. They said they finally realized who killed her. He was in shock. I never would have expected them to be a suspect that will haunt me for the rest of my life. Lynette, Alabama, a small family-oriented town in the heart of the Deep South. Lynette was a mill town. It sits right on the banks of the Chattahoochee River, one of Alabama's major waterways. I always felt safe when I was there. Some people would leave their homes unlocked. We just never had any crime there. 
Lynette is a very tight-knit area. Everybody knows everybody here. August 4th, 1998 was a lazy summer day in Lynette until the peace was shattered by a 911 call. It was around 5.30 when we got the call of an unresponsive woman. Police are surprised to learn the call has come from the home of the town's mayor. Everyone was shocked that it was their house, and I was there within two or three minutes. The 911 caller, Heather Waits, leads police inside to her unresponsive mother. Heather was very hysterical, and the first thing she could say was, help my mom. The first thing I did was go and uh, check for a pulse, and she was cool to the touch. And you could tell that she's been expired for, for, for a little while. Police are stunned to find Charlotte Waits, the wife of the town's mayor, dead in her home. At first, it appears that Charlotte has suffered a tragic accident. We noticed she did have a little foam coming out the corner of her mouth, so we thought that, you know, maybe had a seizure or a reaction to a medicine. As detectives look closer, they begin to suspect foul play. They were red flags that this was more than just an accident. Her right arm and the wrist area appeared to be broken. She had what appeared to be scratch marks on the bottom of her chin and she had some red markings around her neck. We made a decision right then that we're gonna proceed with a homicide investigation. Detectives find signs of a violent struggle. There was a picture that had been knocked off the wall. We could see the nail that was holding that picture up was bent down towards the stairway. So my theory is that it was a fight coming down the stairs. It just looked suspicious. The fact that her purse was dumped over but a purse was still there. You couldn't tell if it was a stage scene or if somebody had come in and she had interrupted a burglary. Was Charlotte the victim of a robbery gone wrong or did her killer want it to appear that way? We didn't see any signs of forced entry. One of the investigators went to the utility room and found two bloody towels. So we want to find out who might have bled on those towels. As forensics collect evidence, Charlotte's husband, Barry, arrives on the scene. Barry worked at the National Guard Armory. At the time, Barry was the acting mayor. The look on his face, he was in shock. He was very, very upset. He started hyperventilating, grabbing his chest. He began to go into what we thought was a heart attack. As Barry is rushed to the hospital, news of Charlotte's murder spreads. I remember the state of shock that I felt. When I got down there to the emergency room, the girls were there, and of course they were upset. Their mother was dead, and their daddy was under a doctor's care for heart issues. Investigators turned to Charlotte's daughters for information about their mother. Charlotte was a very kind, gentle person, always smiling, and cared about others. Charlotte studied education at Auburn University and got married to Barry Waits right after graduating in 1971. She was a second grade teacher. She was very compassionate about her students and just very well liked. Later, Charlotte became a devoted school administrator. She was genuine through and through. She just made such a, a, a nice reputation for herself in the school system and in the community as well. Barry was head of the National Guard Armory and he would often let us use the armory for the science fair, social studies fair. And Charlotte, she was always there helping me with everything. Charlotte and Barry had the perfect marriage. Two great careers, and they had two daughters. Heather was going to college, and Kara was still in high school, getting ready to graduate. When you was around them, you could feel the love. They were well respected in this community. Charlotte was a wonderful mother. I could tell what a deep love she had for her family. Who would take the life of this kind and caring woman, and why? 
Detectives question Heather about how she came to find her mother's body. Heather came home for the weekend. As a college kid, it's time to get your clothes washed and get some good home cooking. Heather said she came into the house, and then when she called out for her mom, and that's when she noticed her mom at the bottom of the stairs. And when she ran up to her, she realized that she wasn't breathing. And when she felt cold, she began to uh, panic. And then that's when she called the ambulance. And then she called her dad. Police are eager to question the mayor, but doctors say they want to keep him overnight for observation. We did find out that he didn't have a heart attack. It was an anxiety-type situation. But we were never able to talk to Barry while he was in the hospital. He got out the next day. On Saturday morning following the murder, we were at the office, myself, the other investigators, and then all of a sudden Barry walks in. When it's this type of murder, it's usually someone very close to him at the same time. Nobody would ever suspect the mayor of doing anything like this. Anyone that knew Barry knew that he's like a big teddy bear. My knowledge of Barry at that point, I'd never seen him upset. He was just friendly and well-respected. Barry didn't fit any kind of profile to do this kind of crime. But we did take the opportunity to just look over him while we were talking to him, see if we could see any visible injuries, and we could not. Barry offers to help with the investigation and agrees to be interviewed. Detectives ask him for his whereabouts the previous day. He told us that the morning he had gone to the armory, just had a normal day, around 11 or so, he left the armory and had gone by the barbershop. He said it was full, so he went back to work the rest of the day until he received a phone call from his daughter telling him that she had found her, uh, her mother. So he rushed home. Investigators hope to verify the mayor's alibi, but they haven't established a clear timeline for Charlotte's murder. The first day of business after the homicide, the only thing we had was a, a, a victim in a neighborhood that these things don't happen. It's going to be one of those cases of a whodunit. Nobody disliked Miss Waits, and there was definitely nobody that you could think of that would want her dead. As fear grips the town of Lynette, suspicion starts to fall on someone close to Charlotte's daughter. Through talking to family, we had learned that Kara was dating a boy that her parents really didn't like because he was living a rough life hand to mouth. Barry and Charlotte both told her that she was not going to see him. And then, of course, they learned that she was seeing him behind their back. At the time of the murder, Carol was still in high school, and she was pregnant. I, I believe that Charlotte knew that Carol was pregnant. Investigators wonder if there had been a deadly confrontation between Charlotte and her daughter's lover. People have been killed for less. Maybe he thought, hey, I want to see your daughter. You're not letting me... So, you're going to pay for it. Coming up, the list of suspects grows. People start calling the tip lines or saying, well, so-and-so told me so-and-so. And small town secrets are revealed. He had been to prison for violent crimes. People are starting to say, you're maybe not the person we thought that you were. Then, new evidence stuns investigators. He's got a money issue, and that's a flag but the prints did not match. I can't put this behind me until it's solved. You may think that you know who did the crime, but you may be wrong. Just 24 hours into the investigation of Charlotte Waite's murder, police have their first suspect, her 17-year-old daughter's boyfriend. We had learned that at the time of the murder, Kara was pregnant. Her boyfriend just wasn't the person that they wanted their daughter to be dating. So maybe there had been some type of conflict. Police bring him into the station for questioning. He told us that he knew that Barry and Charlotte didn't like him. But he said that the day of the murder, he was working with a grass cutting crew somewhere. We were able to go to the person that he was working for that day and they verified his whereabouts through the entire day of the murder. 
with Kara's boyfriend looking unlikely as the killer. Detectives take a closer look at Kara. The day of the murder of Kara, we determined that she was at work babysitting. Then we started looking at Heather. We were able to show that she was at Auburn University. She had actually left 20, 30 minutes prior to finding her mother. We eliminated her. It's been less than two days since Charlotte Waits was found dead, and the investigation is under intense scrutiny from the public and the media. We did have a lot of pressure put on us uh, from the beginning because it's the mayor's wife. He's a pillar of the community, and she's a pillar of the community. With this case being such a high-profile nature, there was a lot of eyes looking at us. I was uh, the host of the morning show on WRLD radio. We were getting calls uh, from people all over the county. I knew Charlotte's family real well. There was so much speculation at the time. Under the close watch of the media, police turned their attention back to the mayor's alibi. On any homicide, when your victim is, is married, you will start inside and then you work your way out. We wanted to find out the timeline of his whereabouts to eliminate him as being a suspect. Barry claims that on the day of the murder, he left work around 11.30 a.m. to run an errand, then returned. Barry said that once he got back to the armory, that he sent a fax to his commander. We traveled to Birmingham to verify who he sent the fax to, and it showed us that Barry got back to the armory at the time that he said he did. Police confirm Barry's fax receipt has a 12.30 p.m. timestamp. But investigators still don't know the exact time of Charlotte's murder. While they wait for the autopsy results, they hope Charlotte's co-workers can help provide the answer. The people that Charlotte worked with told us that Charlotte had gotten to work that morning. And that afternoon, they were having a baby shower for one of her co-workers. They told us that she left around 11 or so. And when she comes home to get fixed up to go out to the little baby shower. They told us that they were getting ready to order out lunch and try to get in touch with her to find out what she wanted. Couldn't get an answer. No one saw Charlotte again until Heather discovered her body nearly six hours later. Our office was horrified. It, we, were, we just couldn't wrap our minds around the fact that our little ray of sunshine was dead. Sergeant Richard Carter was asking us a lot of questions, like, did Charlotte and Barry get along? Charlotte and Barry were always teasing with each other, and he was always being silly and funny, and she would roll her eyes at him, and they didn't appear to have any problems. We said what a wonderful husband he had been, and what a good daddy. Investigators hope to get more information about Barry and Charlotte's relationship from their daughters. We want to find out more about the dynamics of the family. But when the daughters realized that we were looking at their father as, as the suspect, they became upset with us. So they broke contact, and we've lost contact with them. When we were speaking to her friends and her family, nobody could provide anyone who could have a reason to kill Charlotte. Hitting dead ends, investigators dig deeper and begin to look beyond Charlotte's immediate family. They request an interview with her brother, Gene. Gene said he loved his sister tremendously and, and her entire family. He talked about him and Barry being like brothers. Then, Gene reveals a key piece of information. Charlotte had an uncle that had passed away, written into the inheritance. Charlotte got 50%. And we're talking several hundred acres here, which is worth a good bit of money. At this time, they're starting to build auto manufacturing areas here, and you can get lots of money for selling land or land rights. Gene tells police that the inheritance caused problems in the extended family. There was this cousin who felt like he deserved part of that estate. So he was contesting the will. I've actually had to try murder cases where people have shot each other over property lines. And that's nothing compared to thousands and thousands of dollars worth of property. And so you've got heightened tension. Gene also tells investigators that Charlotte was due to meet her attorney about the inheritance on the day she was killed. 
We don't believe in coincidence that on the day she was supposed to have a meeting with an attorney is the day that she was murdered. And at that point, Charlotte's cousin became suspect number one. Detectives investigating the murder of Charlotte Waits have discovered she was about to inherit a large tract of land from her uncle, leaving another family member angry. Charlotte's cousin, Wayne Rice, felt that he was entitled to part of it. And we're talking a substantial good bit of property. She did not like conflict. And the day of the murder, she was supposed to have a meeting with an attorney. Of course, she never made the meeting. Detectives want to know if Wayne went to Charlotte's home to confront her before the meeting. Maybe he thought if she was eliminated, he would have more opportunity for him to get more money out of it. When we contacted Wayne, he agreed to meet with us, but not without his attorney present. Police ask Wayne how he feels about being left out of the family inheritance. He knew that disputing that will caused broken relationships but he said that he didn't wish any ill will on Charlotte. Investigators ask for his whereabouts on the day of the murder. Wayne had told us that he'd gone to work early that morning. He'd gotten off work, gone home. So we wanted to find out, did he have any opportunity to come to Lynette, commit the murder, and, and leave with nobody seeing him. We talked to three of his coworkers and they confirmed that he never left. Uh, didn't even leave for lunch. With Wayne ruled out, police go back to the drawing board. Once we were able to eliminate Wayne, we were kind of left um, again at, at point A. Who could commit this crime and leave and nobody see anything out of the ordinary? Two weeks after Charlotte's murder, detectives received the autopsy report. The pathologist explained that it was a strangulation. The report concludes that the murder weapon was a piece of Charlotte's own clothing. Miss Waits had on a blouse that kind of had the little strings that went across it. And those strings actually created the uh, ligature mark around her neck. And were pulled from behind. The autopsy also confirms that Charlotte suffered other injuries in the attack. She was thrown to the floor in such a violent manner that she suffered a dislocated wrist and the head injury that by itself could have killed her. And the report suggests that Charlotte was struck in the face. The doctor felt like she was punched, which could have subdued her. The blood on the towels found at the scene is identified as Charlotte's. The bloody towels were kind of stuck down in the bottom and, and covered up like somebody was trying to hide them. I would have to describe the last few minutes of Charlotte's life as, as complete terror. She had been savagely attacked. Police receive the crime scene fingerprint analysis and discover a print that doesn't belong. And we get the fingerprint report back, and then there are some unidentified fingerprints. We can't put a suspect with those fingerprints. Police run the prints through the Alabama State Database but it doesn't produce a match. This is so frustrating because you owe it to the victim's family to go make that arrest and always hoping that we're going to get that silver bullet that's going to put it all together and you never get it. Then, just a few days later, a local report of a violent assault draws detectives' attention. Our patrol guys got a call one night to a residence in regards to a lady that called and reported that her boyfriend, Rodney Borum, tried to strangle her. When the officer wrote up the report, he said, this looks awfully familiar to the case that you're working on. Detectives interview the victim and are struck by the similarities in the attack. She reported to the police officers that her boyfriend attacked her from behind, tried to strangle her, but she was able to get away from him. We knew Miss Waits had been choked from behind. 
So you, you have to look at that. Is this an isolated case or an ongoing pattern of violent attacks? We realized that he had actually had a pretty extensive criminal history from another state. He had been to prison numerous times for violent type crimes. So we were extremely interested in Rodney. Police obtained Rodney's prints from the Georgia State Database. We sent those off to the crime lab to compare with the prints that were lifted at the crime scene. When we spoke to Rodney, it was explained to him that this crime looked a lot like what took place with Charlotte. So he knew without a doubt why we were questioning him. As police look into Rodney's claim that he was working on the day of the murder, the lab comes back with fingerprint results. We got notified that Rodney Morgan's prints did not match. And through his alibi, we were able to eliminate him from being in the area that day. Police can't charge Rodney for the alleged assault on his girlfriend due to lack of evidence, so they let him go. Once again, the investigation hits a dead end. You have to keep an open mind. You always be ready for something that's going to take you down a different path. A few days later, a stunning piece of information comes in on the police tip line. We'd gotten a tip that there was a man at a party bragging about killing Charlotte. The tipster claims he overheard someone named Kenny Boyd confess to the crime. He said that he had been at a party for Kenny Boyd and that Kenny Boyd had told him that he had gone in to rob Miss Waits and that she caught him burglarizing the house. We thought this is what we needed. This is the tip that we need. It's going to get us where we need to be. When police go to locate Kenny, they don't have to look very far. When we went and found him, he was inside our county jail. It's been almost two months since the murder of Charlotte Waits, and a witness claims he recently overheard Kenny Boyd confess to the crime. We were told that Kenny Boyd was at a party bragging about killing Charlotte. The witness also tells police that Kenny had an accomplice. Kenny told them that they were breaking in uh, in Charlotte's house. Then Charlotte came home. They jumped her, killed her. Didn't mean to kill her, but did. The two suspects are well known to police. They were always in trouble in and out of jail. Detectives head to Lynette County Jail, where Kenny has been in custody for several days on an unrelated charge. We got inside the jail, sat down in a cell, began interviewing Kenny Boyd. He said he didn't know her, and he said he did not commit the murder. He said, I don't even know where they live, but we want to find out what it was he did that day. Kenny begins to tell us that they are out going to a local store stealing cigarettes and then they're going into a different part of town selling them for crack. Detectives are skeptical of the account and want to hear what Kenny's partner in crime has to say. We find out that the other suspect's in prison in Georgia. So we travel into Georgia and he tells us basically the same story. He says, yeah, we were stealing cigarettes With identical stories from two suspects, investigators look to confirm their alibi. To verify his alibi, the only thing we can do is go to the store that he said that they were selling cigarettes from. Police search the store's security footage for proof the men were there. At the time of the murder, it was documented on video that they are inside that store that he said they were in. It was very frustrating. You may think that you know who did the crime, but you may be wrong. Later on, we find out the guy that had called the tip line on Kenny Boyd that just basically didn't like Mr. Boyd. Police are increasingly concerned that the tip line may be doing more harm than good. That's the thing about a small town and everybody knows everybody. And people start calling the tip lines saying, well, so-and-so told me so-and-so. Through this entire case, we would continually get tips. At times, we felt like they were good tips, credible other times we knew that they were just trying to meddle in the case. The hardest thing was all the different rabbit trails that we kept having to go down because every single tip that we got, we had to chase it. 
that's slowing the investigation down to a crawl because at a trial, you've got to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that somebody committed this crime. And to do that, you've got to disprove all of these bad tips and the rumors and innuendo. With the investigation at a standstill, the public is increasingly angry that no arrest has been made in the six months since Charlotte's murder. The people in this community were frightened. Any murder in a small town, people here know everybody, so you got a lot of pressure when you got a case like this. The fact that Charlotte was so well known inflamed the community. Um, I think there was a lot of angst because of how popular she was and how gentle she was. My heart still ached. It was awful. I would go to her grave and wonder if your murderer comes here and looks and at, at this grave. She was my dear friend and I can't put this behind me until it's solved. The pressure never lessened on this case. The community demanded that somebody gets brought to justice on this case. As months turn into years without justice being served, Charlotte's loved ones carry on as best they can. Barry Waits is no longer mayor, but he continues to serve on Lynette City Council. His daughters, Heather and Kara, have both moved out of town. The girls went on with their lives. Heather got married, and Barry moved on with his life. And he eventually remarried. Every investigator always has one case that stays with them. You go to bed with it, you wake up with it. I never considered it a cold case because it always sat on my desk. It consumed you, especially in a small town, when you know the people involved. Three years after Charlotte's murder, a bizarre development puts the case back in the spotlight. Barry was on our city council, and Barry decided to run for re-election. Well, there was a gentleman who lived in the county who decided to run against Barry. The person running for city council against Barry Waits at that time, his name was Rod Spragans. Rod was a bail bondsman. Uh, he was very well known uh, throughout the community. While on the campaign trail, Rod Spragans makes a stunning statement in the local press. Rod was quoted in the paper as saying that he was 100% convinced that Barry Waits had killed Charlotte. Three years after the murder of Charlotte Waits, Rod Spragans has publicly declared that he knows who killed her. Rod said, Charlotte came to me in a dream and told me that Barry the one that killed her. Rod Spragans gave a statement on live radio accusing Barry of the murder. And we got a lot of calls on that, you know. You know, you got people openly saying it on the radio, why can't y'all make an arrest? Rod's comments raise eyebrows, but police are suspicious of his motives. I think it might not have been taken as seriously knowing it was Rod. Rod Spragans was a, well, he's a con man. One of those that just stirred up stuff. And, and I don't know what his intent was, but in our eyes as investigators, Rod had no evidence. But then, Rod's rash allegation sparks an unexpected development in the case. As talk about Barry Waite spreads, new rumors emerge about a hidden and disturbing side of the former mayor. I kept hearing these rumors. Barry was the caretaker of his mother Savings account. And it was my understanding that out of $100,000, there was $100 and some change left in the account. We found out that his mother was actually losing her house. And people started to look at him going, man, you're maybe not the person we thought that you were. Police decide to take a closer look at Barry's finances. 
As we're pulling banking records, I discover where Barry had taken $12,000 out of his mother's account, put it into his personal account, and spent the money. And this had been prior to the murder. So I think he's stealing from his mother. Where did the money go? You know, if you'll steal from your mother, you'll steal from anybody. Further analysis of Barry's bank records lead police to suspect that Barry is hiding an illicit source of income. We need to find out where he's stealing money from. So, start another side investigation into his financial dealings at work. Investigators interview Barry's superior at the National Guard Armory. The commander was telling me that Barry really doesn't have any any way to steal money, but they're allowed to rent out the armory for weddings and stuff like that. The commander said, but he hasn't rented this thing out in quite a while. Investigators find that Barry had been renting out the armory without notifying his superiors. Barry was using his position to rent the armory out, and then he was holding the money on his own, and, and that actually amounted up to a pretty substantial amount. Barry had worked for the National Guard Armory for at least 20 years. When they realized that he was stealing money from them, they were in shock. They couldn't believe it. Barry agrees to talk to police about the alleged embezzlement. We went to interview him in regards to the theft. He confessed right away about the theft. Give us a full statement. We indicted him, and he ended up working out a plea bargain agreement. And he was sentenced to six months in jail. With Barry temporarily behind bars, investigators shift their focus to one crucial question. Could his greed and financial desperation have had something to do with Charlotte's murder? And just because you're a thief doesn't make you a murderer, but because you need money real bad, that is motive for you to kill somebody. Barry's got a money issue, and that's a flag. Police discover a pattern of behavior that began years prior, during his marriage to Charlotte. At the time of the murder, they were behind on several payments, car payments, telephone. They were behind in their utility bills. Although we don't know where the money's going, couldn't determine it if Barry had a girlfriend or anything, couldn't find any gambling problems, no drug issues. Police finally uncover the nature of Barry's voracious spending. We learned that Barry had a problem playing the stock market, and he had lost a bunch of money. He would do it without Charlotte knowing it, because it was totally against her wishes. Investigators develop a theory of the murder that revolves around Charlotte's disputed inheritance. Charlotte's cousin, Wayne Rice, he was contesting the will, so we thought she wanted it settled. And Barry did not want to settle. He was trying to talk her into holding out. Don't give Wayne Rice any money. And she was supposed to have a meeting with an attorney on the day that she was murdered. Did an argument erupt over the inheritance, leading Barry to murder his wife? I never would have expected Barry to be the suspect in Charlotte's death. Now, later, doubts began to cloud my mind. Money had to be a factor in this murder case. I never felt like he went home to kill her that day. I think it was a fight, and I felt that if I could ever get him to talk to me again, I could get a confession from him. Police ask Barry for another interview. He agrees. I told him our goal was to continue to work on his wife's murder case, and, but we needed to talk to him some more. He asked me, can I call my wife? And the state investigator told him, the only person you can call is your attorney. Well, that pissed him off. So he said, fine, let me talk to my attorney. So it ruined any chance we had to have a confession. Once again, the investigation goes cold. There was some angst in the community. We don't want an unsolved murder. We want closure to this case. And I don't think it was ever a case where the police didn't want to bring this to trial. I think it just took time to put a puzzle together. Police are stunned when nearly five years after Charlotte's murder, 
a pair of unexpected witnesses come forward. Barry's daughters, they went to the DA's office to their crime victim's uh, advocate. After refusing to speak with police for years, Heather and Kara provide investigators with explosive new information. And then finally, after so many years, they were ready to offer what they could to find justice for their mother. The daughters of murder victim Charlotte Waits are finally ready to talk to police after years of silence. That was a big turning point for us because prior to the time, the girls wouldn't talk to us because the investigation was pointing to their father. As time went on, Heather and Kara began to have doubts about Barry's innocence. When Heather and Kara came forward, they began to tell investigators about their dad stealing money from them. The women provide a detailed account of how their father had left them penniless. Because of Barry being a uh, suspect in his wife's murder, the insurance company would never pay her death benefit. At some point, he was able to convince the insurance company to, to leave the money to the daughters. At that point, Barry made his daughters an offer for Charlotte's inherited property. He said, if you'll give me that insurance money, I will give you the land so they give their dad the money. But when the land dispute settled, he signed over the property to his new wife and left his daughters out to dry. As police dig deeper, they learn how Barry had manipulated his daughters into silence. The youngest girl had been being told by her father, you're the main suspect in this case. You can't talk to the police because everybody in this town believes that you killed your mother. Detectives also find out that Barry tried to throw police off his trail by providing false tips. He's been submitting Kara's name, submitting the boyfriend's name, throwing red herrings at us. You're making us chase down rabbit holes. Now they've learned what kind of person their dad is, and they said they finally realized that their dad killed their mother. With the women offering to testify against their father, the district attorney reviews the evidence and decides to prosecute the case. The day that we were able to have that warrant served, it was a good day. Barry is charged with the first degree murder of his wife of over two decades, Charlotte Waits. But the case is not a slam dunk. You can convict on circumstantial evidence. But when you do that, you have to rule out every other plausible explanation. The trial begins in November of 2006. Prosecutors begin by describing how and why Barry killed his wife. They assert that Barry left work around 11.30 a.m. to confront Charlotte at home about her disputed inheritance. So Barry left Armory, went straight home to talk her out of making that settlement offer. And Barry comes home, and they start arguing. And she says, this is my family, and I'm going to do it, and this is my decision. Then, Barry turned violent. And at that point, he gets her. It caused her nose to bleed, and she wipes up with, with towels, and that was enough. She's just getting out of there and getting away from Barry. But Barry doesn't let Charlotte escape. He reaches and grabs her shirt and pulls her shirt back and starts choking her. And he pulls it so tight that he absolutely strangles the life out of his weights. And then he takes her and just kicks her down the steps. He goes down and leans over the body to make sure that she's dead. Prosecutors say Barry attempted to cover up his crime. He hastily hides the bloody towels and dumps Charlotte's purse. And then he leaves and he starts putting his alibi together. He then goes back to the armory and he sends a fax. And that fax is supposed to be putting him out of, out of the time frame of being at, her, at the house the time she's killed. The prosecution shows that Barry had sufficient time to commit the murder. 
There was an hour and a half time frame from when Mr. Waits had left the armory and back to the armory when he sends a fax. And prosecutors prove that every other suspect had an airtight alibi. Every other name, every other person that was mentioned, we can, we can eliminate them. But we could not eliminate Barry. Later, an expert rules out the possibility of an unknown intruder based on further analysis of the unidentified prints at the scene. The fingerprint expert says these are little kids' fingerprints. They don't have anything to do with this crime. But Barry Waits' fingerprints were down low, close to Charlotte Waits' body. Finally, Barry's daughters take the stand. You could read it on their faces and you could hear it in their voices. They were 100% convinced that their dad killed their mother. After a brief deliberation, the jury reaches a verdict. When the jury came back guilty, it wasn't a relief. It was just a feeling of, of calm. I went to her grave that afternoon and I said, okay, sweet girl, you can rest in peace because we know that that your killer is gonna pay for what he did. Barry Waits, the former mayor of Lynette, is sentenced to 40 years in prison. I think at one time, Barry was a person that intended to take care of his family. But whatever demons he had that made him burn up his family's money, his mother's money, consumed him, overtook him, and the need for money was more important than his wife's life or his daughter's love. This sweet family was totally devastated by that one senseless criminal act. I think Charlotte would want to be remembered as a person who loved life, loved her family, Loved her profession. Every day of my life, I miss her. He was a popular high school teen with a big heart. He was loved by everybody. He was there for anybody, anytime. He was a really likable and, and caring person. Until his life was violently stolen while he slept. It was unbelievable, because I was trying to figure out what was going on. We pretty much are starting with a blank slate. It was really a whodunit. Don't have a lot of answers. Detectives unearth a world of deceit and intimidation. She said if he would have just kept his mouth shut, this never would have happened. There were two teenagers bragging about being connected with a homicide. He was already in custody, so was this something that he had orchestrated? To reveal a sinister plot. A fisherman contacted the police department and said, hey, I found this gun. So that was a twist where you never would have expected that. The whole scenario was crazy. And discover a mastermind no one expected. We were dumbfounded, like, what just happened here? I don't think anybody thought that this is how it would end. I felt totally betrayed. I wasn't just shocked. I was floored. Set against the picturesque backdrop of the Oregon Mountains, the small town of Eugene is 100 miles south of Portland. The community is nice. It's a good place to raise a family. It's a college community. Uh, the University of Oregon is there. It's a, it's a beautiful area of the Pacific Northwest. Eugene's a small town, uh, relatively. We're like the second or third largest city in Oregon, but that's still about 200,000 people. It's a quiet place. In the early morning hours on Monday, October 3rd, 1994, the serenity of this close-knit community is shattered. A 911 call was made. It was a mother who was in anguish. Her teenage son had been seriously injured, bleeding from his head. Emergency units raced to the home, arriving in a matter of minutes. When the first responders arrived, they were able to quickly assess that it was gunshot wound to the head. And although he was unconscious, he was still alive. 
As paramedics battle to save the teen, police arrive to investigate the shooting. Janice Itura identifies the victim as her 18-year-old son, Aaron Itura. Aaron Itura was almost immediately transported to the hospital. As detectives get to work, they need to determine who would shoot a teenage boy and why. In short order, we're preserving the scene, beginning to document it with photographs, and start gathering information. His bedroom had been partitioned off inside the attached garage of the residence. He had furnished it or decorated it as, you know, typical teen male would. He had been in bed asleep with a, a girl that he was dating at the time. We knew he had sustained a devastating gunshot wound to the head. The girlfriend who was lying beside him was unharmed. Police ask her to wait with the family while they continue to investigate the crime scene. Been a fragment of the bullet was found at the scene. It seemed like the caliber of the gun was a 38 caliber. The weapon is nowhere to be found, and there's no sign of forced entry to the home. Somebody had just opened the garage door. It wasn't locked. There's nothing of value missing. Detectives wonder if the attacker could have a personal motive. If somebody had a gun and they went in there to steal property, but the people woke up and discovered them, you would expect both people to be shot. The fact that one person wasn't shot and the other one was would indicate that there's a motive to single that person out. With the crime scene yielding little information, detectives question those closest to Aaron, his family and girlfriend, who were at the scene of the crime. I mean, it was a really uh, whodunit out of the blue. You don't have a lot of answers. The police department, we're still trying to figure out what happened and who was involved. The detective questions how Janice came to find Aaron. Aaron had gone to his room and his girlfriend and Carrie was spending the night. And then all of a sudden, about 1.30 in the morning, I hear screaming. So I went out to the bedroom, and here's Aaron on the bed, and his girlfriend, Carrie's just freaked out. And I looked at Aaron, and he had a big old gash on his head. Then I saw blood. And I called 911, and then I just grabbed him and held him for a while. I was trying to figure out what happened. Aaron Itura was born on December 28, 1975. He was the oldest of five children, raised by single mom Janice. Aaron was a good kid. He was there for anybody, anytime. And he had a lot of responsibilities as far as uh, helping out, because I worked sometimes two jobs, and he took care of uh, all of his young siblings. Growing up, Aaron was always tall for his age and came to be known as a gentle giant. People described him a big, lovable teddy bear. He was a really um, likable and, and caring person with a mom who was really involved in his life. In his last year of high school, Aaron was popular, well-respected, and easygoing. Well, he liked to draw. He wanted to go to art school in New York, and that was his goal. Recently, Aaron had found love with a local girl named Carrie. She worked at the little neighborhood store, and they had been dating about four or five months. Aaron took pride in his community and was highly active in the area's anti-gang movement. He had the courage to step up and do what was right. He was just the type of guy that uh, people came to with their problems. He was the protector. He watched out for everybody. Aaron was looking ahead to a bright future. No one can think of anyone who'd want to shoot this young man point blank in his own bed. Investigators turned to Aaron's girlfriend, Carrie, who was lying next to him during the attack. Carrie tells detectives she awoke to the sound of the gunshot, but couldn't see much in the dark. Carrie, the girlfriend, certainly needs to be looked at as a potential suspect because of her proximity at the time the shooting occurs. The police decided to take her down to the police station and to talk to her in a lot more detail about what she knew. While police transfer Carrie to the station, detectives focus on Aaron's family. In the early stages, it's really important to exclude witnesses from being possible suspects. Part of the procedure of the police was to take gunshot residue swabs from the people in the house. 
And I needed to get to the hospital. I needed to see how he was. But we couldn't leave. We had to wait till we were cleared through the gunpowder residue testing. Aaron's mom and siblings test negative for gunshot residue. They immediately race to the hospital. Janice was almost immediately notified by a doctor that her son's brain scans showed that there was no brain activity. The nurse was trying to tell me that you know, he's not going to make it. Later that morning, the decision is made to take Aaron off life support. I think he just was done fighting. I lost a big chunk of my heart. I just couldn't believe that I'll never see him again. As Aaron's family grieve their devastating loss, at the station, detectives interview Aaron's girlfriend, Carrie. They ask her if she knows of anyone who would want to harm Aaron. She claimed he didn't know why this occurred and who would have a motive to have killed him. When detectives question Carrie about trouble in their relationship, she denies any problems. Maybe she just wasn't being straight or truthful. Right off, you know, you can't rule out the possibility that someone like Carrie may have shot Aaron for some personal motive. Forensics check Carrie's hands and clothing to determine if she fired the weapon that killed Aaron. Gunshot residue wasn't there. Swabs confirmed that she was not involved in a shooting. With Carrie ruled out as the shooter, police ask her if anything unusual happened that night. She tells police about a mysterious phone call Aaron received just hours before the crime. Carrie had mentioned a call had been made to the house. It was some girl, you know, just wanting to know if Aaron was there. And then the caller hung up. Investigators have Carrie walk them through the moments before Aaron was shot. She said she was laying next to him. They were both fast asleep when she was awakened by some noise, which, as it turns out, was a gunshot. Then, Carrie reveals a crucial detail. Carrie becomes a, a key part of the investigation. She mentioned that she'd seen who did it. Coming up, the investigation takes a stunning turn. What? We learned, indicated that they knew a lot more about what happened than what they'd said originally. And unravels a tale of betrayal. And I'm just like, did I just hear her say what I think I heard her say? There was almost something pathological about their relationship. To reveal a ruthless killer hiding in plain sight. They were absolutely a master manipulator. It was what they call Jekyll and Hyde. It was really shocking how the case turned. Police are investigating the murder of 18-year-old Aaron Itura, gunned down in his sleep. Aaron's girlfriend, Carrie, is the sole eyewitness to the crime, and police are hoping she can provide them with a lead. The police department are still trying to figure out what is the reason why he would be singled out and killed. Detectives continue to question Carrie about the details surrounding the murder. Carrie provided information to the police that it was two killers. She believed they had their faces covered with bandanas and their hands covered, so she could not get a good description of them. She was able to identify them as young males, but not much beyond that. But who could the two masked assailants be? Police ask Carrie if she can think of anyone in her recent past who would want to harm Aaron. She might have had a jealous next boyfriend who might have had a grudge against Aaron that she would have been aware of. And so we were exploring all of those avenues to find any potential connections. After interviewing Carrie, police dig into her background and find no serious ex-boyfriend or anyone else that could link to the crime. With no significant leads, investigators turn to the community for help. We pretty much are starting with a blank slate. The police had kind of fanned out, you know, into the community and were asking people whether they knew anything about what had happened to Aaron Itura. 
But no one heard or saw anything suspicious. For this laid-back community, news of Aaron's brutal murder is a shock. All we knew was this young man had been sleeping in his bed and somebody had gotten in there and shot and killed him. We were dumbfounded, like, what, what just happened here? This is Eugene, Oregon. You don't have young people being killed right in their home, in their bedroom while they're sleeping. And people were scared. Detectives begin to look at Aaron's work with the anti-gang group. Had he made some dangerous enemies? Law enforcement was certainly concerned about gang activity. There was a sense anyway that Aaron, he's been at these anti-gang task force meetings and now this kid uh, has been shot in the head. So it certainly raises questions. Police learned that Aaron had been working closely with local anti-gang activist, Mary Thompson. A lot of people knew who Mary Thompson was. She was wanting to sound the alarm about gangs in Eugene. And she established herself as kind of the citizen voice among law enforcement and other agencies dealing with that. She was a working mom with a teen, her son Bo, who was getting in and out of trouble. Mary Thompson was involved in publicizing the threat of gangs. How that developed for her was that her son Bo, who was 16 and had gotten involved uh, in some gang activity and serious crimes. She said he's a member of a local Crip gang, and if it can happen in my family, it can happen in any families. And oftentimes, she was going to various schools and in the media for an anti-gang sentiment. Mary's home was open to troubled teens trying to avoid gang life, but she needed help with her expanding network. Aaron got approached in school about assisting with the community outreach. He took that role seriously. Aaron was very proud. Sometimes I could hear him talking to his sisters about, you know, I've got to do this. I'm gonna help some kid someday, and Mary's on the right track. I thought she was amazing. Here's a woman that's 40-some years old, and she is out with Aaron, making people aware, because most people in this town had no idea that this was going on. The day after the murder, investigators pay Mary a visit, looking for a lead. She was shocked that Aaron Artura had been shot and killed, and more than willing to try to help in any way that she could. She offered a whole list of names of people that she knew were associated with him. Then, Mary shares a disturbing detail. When the police went to talk to Mary Thompson, she told them about a gang member from Portland that was a crip that had stopped by her house looking for Aaron Itura before the homicide. And she identified him by the name of Sonny and said what kind of car he was driving. And this gang was dangerous. He wasn't somebody that she previously knew. Just that he had showed up and was inquiring about Aaron. Where does he live and what can you tell me about him sort of thing. Her information was is that people in the gang life up in Portland were upset because of Aaron's cooperation in anti-gang efforts. Given the proximity of, of when this had occurred to Aaron's death, you couldn't ignore that this might all be coming out of people in Portland. She provided a general description of Sonny and of a car that he was driving. He wasn't uh, on our radar. So the information about Sonny was documented and passed on and shared with the Portland Gang Bureau. While Portland's gang unit tracked down Sonny, Eugene police talked with Aaron's friends. Had Aaron been concerned for his own safety before the murder? They said before the homicide, Aaron Itura told them a story about a gang member wanting to do harm to him. But there's not a lot of information. This could be significant. This might, in fact, be gang related. So we were looking for the active gang member of Sonny. Less than 36 hours after Aaron Itura is found shot in his bed. Investigators believe the cold-blooded murder of the teen could be tied to his work in an anti-gang group. According to Aaron's mentor, Mary Thompson, a gang member named Sonny had been looking for him. The result of the inquiry with Portland has come back and they came up blank. They had no information about any Sonny. 
the car description didn't match anything in their files. So it was a big zero. You know, they were just saying, we don't have anything. So as a result of that, we were frustrated that we didn't have a suspect. Then, detectives received the autopsy results. Aaron sustained a fatal gunshot wound to the head, and uh, it was a single shot. It was an aim shot with a 38 caliber to the back of the head that would go through the brain and have almost a 100% chance of causing the death of the person that was hit. 48 hours into the case, with few clues to investigate, the pressure on police increases. There's a sense of uncertainty and unease, you know, that, that can permeate the community if you don't solve this crime, if it remains unsolved. When you're in a small community, you want some answers because somebody out there in the town we live in snuck into the bedroom of this young man and killed him. That's scarier than anything when you don't know any other details. The lack of progress also takes a toll on Aaron's family. There was times that I would have been willing to follow Aaron, but I put my grief on the back burner. Continue taking care of my kids because it's not their fault. But it was so hard with just certain songs, certain times. I just would kind of collapse. It's just kind of what you do. Fortunately, Janice isn't without support. Friends like Aaron's mentor, Mary, helped the family get through tough times. Mary Thompson was very sorry. She couldn't understand who would ever do that. We both were grieving. So I got some really nice words from her. I'm in the mindset of, well, we're gonna catch who did this, who shot him, and she's like agreeing with me, yeah, we need to find out who did this. At the station, police search for new leads and find a report about a recent incident involving Aaron and are surprised when they come across a familiar name. Mary Thompson's son, whose name was Bo Flynn, was connected to this case. He was 16 years old. Bo had been involved in the juvenile system before for his violence and criminal activity. He was empowered and emboldened by a dangerous crime. We learned that Mary asked Aaron to keep an eye out for Bo and try to steer him clear of trouble. The plan was just simply for Aaron to spend time with Bo, be a positive influence. But instead of Bo moving away from trouble, he drags Aaron into it. Three weeks before the murder, they have a dangerous encounter. Bo and Aaron were in West Eugene and uh, encountered some other youths. And one of them had some prior issue with Bo. Bo suspected that this kid had snitched him off or they got into an argument or whatever it might be. The confrontation escalated. Bo, who was carrying a knife, produced the knife and ended up cutting the other kid. Patrol officers arrived and they both were arrested. Aaron went to the Lane County Jail. They had to go down and get him. And I was so mad at him that I said, you're responsible for your actions. But he did know right from wrong. And he was not afraid to stand up for what was right. Then, Aaron makes a risky decision to testify against Bo. Aaron was killed on October 3rd, just two days before he was due to give his witness statement. Was this the reason for Aaron's murder? We consider the possibility that Bo was involved in the killing especially as this potential motive emerged that Aaron was a witness in a pending case against Bo that would result in him being incarcerated potentially three or four years. Investigators pay a visit to Bo, who's in custody at the state's juvenile facility for the knife assault. He was uh, already in custody at the time that the homicide occurred, so was this something that Bo had orchestrated? When detectives interview Bo Flynn and ask him what happened, Bo Flynn uh, says, I didn't do anything, you know, I don't know anything about it. At the time, there wasn't any credible information that developed that suggested that he had orchestrated this crime. The police don't have any evidence that gives Bo's role in the commission of this murder. Having lost Bo as a viable suspect, detectives are at risk of hitting a standstill in the case. But then, 
Aaron's mom contacts police with a disturbing new lead. I told him that somebody heard a couple of other people at the high school were talking about how they were going to take care of the big guy. And we all knew the big guy was Aaron because he was the biggest kid at Willamette High School. We also were hearing rumors that there were two young gang members involved in the community bragging about being connected with a homicide. Police dig deeper into these rumors, turning to Aaron's friends for more details. When we're talking to kids that were associated with Aaron, we're just trying to find out, what do you know, and who could have done this? Jim Elstad and Joe Brown had been identified as part of this loose-knit group of kids that were often frequenting the Thompson residence and they were kind of on the fringe. The information persisted. They both admitted and talked about the murder itself. They were saying that they had done the killing. They were proud of what they'd done. These kids needed to be contacted. Even as we were working, it, it was really shocking how the case turned. Police investigating the execution-style shooting of 18-year-old Aaron Itura have a new lead. Two local teens have been bragging about the killing. What the word was on the street was Joseph Brown and James Elstad were the two individuals involved in the killing of Aaron Itura. I knew they were friends of Bo's, but these kids were Aaron's friends as well. Jim Elstad grew up with my kids. His little brother was my daughter's best friend. And hearing that he would even be involved was just bizarre. But that's what they were saying. We were told from the circle of kids that were being identified and contacted, said that Jim Elstad and Aaron Atura had been friends at one time, and that most recently, leading up to the homicide, that relationship had soured. So a source of friction that should be explored and investigated. Joe Brown and Jim Elstad, they didn't appear to have criminal records, so there wasn't a whole lot to go on. Before police can speak to the two teens, they get a surprise visit from Mary Thompson. She indicated that she also heard that Joseph Brown and Jim Elstad might have been involved in the homicide. But what Mary reveals next stuns the detective. The homicide happened on October 3rd in the early morning hours, and she tells the police that both Elstad and Brown ended up coming to her house after the homicide and telling her that they had killed Itura. She acknowledged that she hadn't been entirely candid with us from the beginning. Her explanation for that was, well, I just didn't believe him. I just couldn't imagine them doing it. I wasn't seeing anything in their demeanor that suggests that they had done this this homicide, and so I didn't volunteer that information up front because I didn't think it was credible at the time. But now Mary believes the two teens could have been telling the truth. Armed with this new information, police bring Jim Elstead and Joe Brown to the station for questioning. When they were interviewed, both of them denied any knowledge of the homicide. Elstead and Brown had agreed to take polygraphs. Uh, as a way to clear themselves of suspicion. And so they were each polygraphed uh, that same day and uh, both flunked. Detectives grill the teens for hours and eventually they break down and confess. Brown and Elstad finally acknowledged that they had been involved and had done the homicide. To understand how Aaron Itura was killed that night, Police have Joseph Brown recreate the murder at the crime scene. He had agreed to come back and, and do what we call a walkthrough, where you're basically doing a videotape statement, and you're describing, and, t and in some instances you might even enact, you know, what, what occurred. Joe tells police he was the lookout, and Jim Elstad was the one who shot Aaron. But what was their motive? Gradually what emerged was they were upset uh, because uh, their their homie, Bo, you know, was uh, at risk of uh, being incarcerated further because Aaron was cooperating with the police and was willing to testify against him in this uh, knife incident. In their statements, Joseph Brown and uh, James Elstad took personal responsibility for the homicide. 
They did not say that their activities were at the direction of Bo. Detectives need something concrete to corroborate their story, so they ask about the murder weapon. When police ask Joe Brown what happened to the gun, he tells them it's in the river. After the homicide, Joseph Brown throws the gun into the river to dispose of it. Police search the river for the gun, but can't find it. The fact emerged, you know, that we were looking for the weapon. A fisherman contacted the police department and said, hey, I don't know if it's connected or not, but I was fishing that stretch of the river, and I found this gun. So a patrol officer is sent out uh, and takes possession of the gun from him and books it into evidence. They then do a ballistic check on the gun, and they find out it was consistent with the murder weapon. You have their confession, and you've got the murder weapon, so you can corroborate their confession to the point where the conviction of those two people is solid. On October 6th, 1994, Jim Elstad and Joe Brown are arrested for the murder of 18-year-old Aaron Itura. It was very hard to find out. Jim Elstad shot Aaron while he was sleeping. That was like, just unbelievable. After the arrests, Aaron's mentor, Mary Thompson, reaches out to Janice. Mary called me first. It was like, well, we need to get together, maybe have a coffee, and I'll buy you lunch. And then she said, if Aaron would have just kept his mouth shut, this never would have happened. And I'm just like, did I just hear her say what I think I heard her say? At that point, I got real concerned. So I called Detective Rainey and told him what happened. What we learned indicated that Mary knew a lot more about what happened than she had said originally. For police, Mary's alarming statement is one of many things they are now questioning. Initially, it was uh, thought to just be uh, this uh, homicide that had been committed by these two guys, but there was just this overriding uh, perception that she was more involved than she had admitted. Less than a week after 18-year-old Aaron Itura was shot to death in his bed, former friends Jim Elstad and Joe Brown are charged with his murder. But now, the actions of Aaron's anti-gang mentor, Mary Thompson, have detectives thinking the case is far from over. Mary Thompson's behavior had been raising some red flags. She failed to mention that Brown and Elstad came to her house that night it was just a convenient fact that she forgot to mention. And she also had made a call to Janice. That was actually unusual, suspicious in nature. At that point, the police decided to take her down to the police station and to talk to her in more detail. Investigators want to know why Mary withheld information surrounding Aaron's murder. In that interview, she talks about being extremely angry with Aaron Itura after he informed on her son about the knife fight. But she didn't want him to be killed. Do we know for sure that she's implicated in the murder? No. Uh, can we prove it at that time? No. Since police lack solid evidence that Mary is involved, they let her go. With the killers behind bars, Aaron's loved ones gathered to say their final farewells. It was one beautiful, beautiful day. High school kids, teachers, counselors, they all showed up. Mary was there as well. And there was probably 2,000 people. People I didn't even know were there. Aaron was loved by everybody. Five days after the arrest of Aaron's murderers, police are still troubled by Mary Thompson's unusual behavior. So they dig deeper into her past. 10 or 15 years prior, there were some other events in Josephine County, which is a county in Southern Oregon. She uh, had identified herself as being a person that was working as an assistant to prosecuting the drug trade. And it turned out that she was a methamphetamine manufacturer at that time, and that she got caught selling methamphetamine. Looking at Mary Thompson's past, she was engaged in that criminal activity. It was definitely shocking. 
she was a crime fighter that the community trusted that had engaged in that kind of behavior. So that was a twist where you never would have expected that. Mary's history proves she's capable of lying and manipulating to get what she wants. Now investigators wonder what she's capable of in connection to this case. As we knew and, and learned more about her, it was pretty eye-opening, you know, shocking even to investigators. Part of the picture that emerged uh, about Mary was her relationship with her son, Bo, and how protective she had been of him. She'd had a bunch of relationships in her life that had not turned out, and the only one that stayed with her was Bo Flynn, her son. And so she was willing to do things that were antisocial and illegal in order to maintain Bo's relationship with her. She viewed herself as being a peer instead of directing her son to be a law-abiding citizen she chose to get in the criminal gutter with him there was almost uh, you know i'm no expert but i mean almost something pathological um, about their relationship in terms of what a parent will do to protect their child she knew that aaron was the only thing standing between her and her son's charges after Bo. The only person that had motive to eliminate Aitur as a witness was Mary Thompson. Detectives start questioning the teens Mary claims she's been keeping out of gangs. When we're talking to kids that were identified as having frequented the Thompson residence, they weren't involved in school, they didn't have healthy relationships, they were all kind of lacking something in their life and felt that. It seemed that she already had developed the family structure that she was able to manipulate for her own purposes. And she had somehow orchestrated the murder of Aaron Itura. And as a result of that, she began emerging more and more as this prime suspect. But could Mary go so far as to have Aaron killed? To advance this investigation, the idea came up about doing a wiretap to see if something was being said here that could be used to either eliminate Mary from suspicion or would lead to evidence to convict her of murder. On the wiretap, detectives hear Mary's son, Bo, who's on parole, discussing gang activities with other gang members. They called themselves the 74 Hoover Crips. They were involved in selling drugs and stealing property. And we were thinking it was possible Bo was in charge of the gang. Just when investigators think Bo is the gang leader, someone else comes on the line. It became quickly apparent that Mary was calling the shots. She was uh, pressuring people to do stuff. Mary Thompson's role in the gang is definitely as a leader. They heard Mary planning robberies, beatings, car thefts, just a hive of criminal activity. Mary Thompson, in her exchanges, in these intercepted uh, phone calls, you know, clearly is talking the talk. I mean, she knows the lingo, the street language, and she's a very legitimate threat. She tells them she's got connections outside of Eugene, even, that if need be, she can marshal to come in and start dealing with people. But nothing links Mary directly to Aaron's murder until she makes a telling statement. There's a conversation that she has with a gang member and she says, don't worry, I haven't screamed at you, have I? Aaron Itura got screamed at before he got whacked. He knew how I felt. So she essentially admits to the gang killing Itura. We ripped off the veneer of her being this concerned mom who only immersed herself in this culture out of concern for her son. Facts that were developing were pretty revealing. Though the admission is damning, detectives know they'll need more to secure a conviction. We felt that we needed a direct witness who would tell us about all these conversations that happened up and including the homicide of Aaron Itura. Our tactic was to break the gang, essentially, and to see what we could do about getting them to testify against Mary Thompson. In the cold-blooded killing of Aaron Itura, police have arrested two young gang members. Now, wiretaps have revealed Aaron's anti-gang mentor, Mary Thompson, is actually a ruthless gang leader. Mary Thompson became 
a prime suspect in the case. And the wiretaps were really instrumental in revealing the extent of the influence that Mary had. Investigators are now convinced Mary is behind the 18-year-old's murder. But to charge her, they need additional evidence. We arrested the gang for all of these crimes that they committed that we knew about during the wire, whether it was committing a burglary or stealing weapons. Investigators then questioned the teen gang members, hoping to get them to flip on Mary. The prosecutor thinks their best shot lies with one of the youngest members of the gang, named Lisa. We decided that we were going to give Lisa immunity on the condition that she testified about the gang and about the homicide of Aaron Itura. Lisa agrees to tell investigators everything she knows. It became pretty clear not only was Mary the leader of the gang, but when it came to eliminating Itura, the behavior of Elstad and Brown was guided by her. Mary was always saying that something's got to be done about Aaron. We can't let him testify against Bo, and that shifted to actually killing him. From Lisa's account of Aaron's murder, the missing pieces fall into place. The Friday before the homicide, there's a big meeting of the gang at Mary Thompson's house. Mary encouraged Jim Elstad to commit the homicide. On the night of the murder, Lisa's role is that she is the one that calls Aitura's residence. And when Aitura answers the phone, she hangs up on him. And that information gets communicated back to Jim Elstad and Joseph Brown that Aitura is at his house and they should go forward and commit the crime. Mary tells Brown and Elstad to wait until everyone in the Aitura home is asleep. 1.30 in the morning when Aaron was in bed with a girlfriend, Carrie, they were both fast asleep. Brown and Elstad had snuck into the room and Joe Brown was the lookout. And then Jim Elstad hadn't hesitated and, and fired once into Aaron's head. Carrie then was awakened by that noise. By then, Elstad and Brown had fled uh, the garage. They go to Mary Thompson's house after having committed the homicide. And then Joe Brown gets taken to the river, and Mary Thompson takes him there to dispose of the gun. And this is kind of significant that was even done at her suggestion. At the outset of the investigation, Mary Thompson went to police with information on Brown and Elstad in an attempt to throw police off her trail. Throughout all this, of course, Mary's trying to keep her fingerprints off everything, so she's evading responsibility. But her influence it resulted in Aaron Aitura's death. Mary Thompson was absolutely a master manipulator. That was demonstrated many, many times. In February 1995, Mary is charged with aggravated homicide for her role in killing Aaron Aitura. I was floored. I just had no idea that Mary could have been involved at that extent. It was just what they call Jekyll and Hyde, you know. I felt totally betrayed by another mom. I don't think anybody suspected when she was teaching us about gangs that she actually was planning the whole thing. Everybody was trying to do the right thing by her and, and her crusades and her telling me how amazing my son was and the idea that he would go out and help her and then find out that she would have murdered my son herself. In December 1994, Joe Brown and Jim Elstad received 10 and 16 years respectively after pleading guilty to the murder of Aaron Itura. Almost two years later, on June 4th, 1996, Mary Thompson goes to trial and pleads not guilty. Gang members testify in court, supporting the prosecution's case. They all eventually, you know, uh, came on board and were effective witnesses. After a six-week trial on July 23rd, 1996, the jury finds 41-year-old Mary Thompson guilty for her role in the murder of Aaron Itura. It's been such an emotional trauma on us all. This is like, it's not only me that she's hurt, it's not only my son that she's destroyed, it's my family, his friends, the kids involved, everybody. 
She's probably been doing this her whole life, but she didn't win. Mary Thompson is sentenced to life in prison for aggravated murder, among other charges, including hindering the prosecution. When you think of the level of deception that she perpetrated, and then ultimately to see her held responsible for that, that's a real satisfying feeling as an investigator. The whole case from beginning to end was unsettling. I don't think anybody would have gone into it and thought that uh, this is how it would end. Aaron's loved ones find relief in the closing of that dark chapter in their lives. They try their best to move forward, but thoughts of the good-natured 18-year-old are never far away. I talked to him daily, but my family was a whole unit. You know, you got one spoke missing. He was the protector. I always feel he's here. You know, he's around us. You know, he still had the courage to do the right thing. And he he did the right thing in the end, even though it cost him his life. a selfless and caring mother of three. She always thought about other people. She was just a bright light shining. Viciously murdered in her own home. Her bedroom was incredibly blood soaked, unlike I'd ever seen before. There was anger involved in this crime. I remember just screaming. Investigators are sent down a rabbit hole of suspects. She didn't like him, she didn't trust him. It raised a red flag that there might be some sort of affair going on. She was jealous of her life, of what she had. There was clearly bad blood between them. Every lead appears to turn into a dead end. It just stalled. That was disheartening. Until a surprising witness comes forward. It was unbelievable. It was the break we were looking for. Exposing a killer no one saw coming. I was pretty shocked. I just remember being sick to my stomach. Cortland Township lies in the heart of Michigan. It's fairly rural, nice, pleasant, kind of a good hometown feel. It's one of those areas that everybody gets along, and when you're driving by their house, they're waving at you, and it's just peaceful and quiet. This quaint community is stunned on Saturday, August 5th, 2006, when the Kent County Sheriff's Office receives a 911 call. Emergency. My daughter, we just found her in bed, and she's got a lash on her arm, and she's all bloody. Just before 5 o'clock, we received a, a call of a potential suicide at the Pagel residence. Officers are immediately dispatched to the home of 41-year-old Renee Pagel. We were met by Renee's stepmother and her father. They were both just in shock. Renee's father indicated that his daughter was in her bedroom. When I first walked into the bedroom, I observed... Renee laying on the bed. I just remember seeing all the blood. The blood-soaked sheets, her shirt, there's blood on her face. It was obvious that Renee Pagel was deceased, and it wasn't a suicide. This was a homicide. Officers secure the scene as homicide detectives arrive to investigate. Her bedroom was incredibly blood-soaked, unlike I'd ever seen before. The bed was covered with blood. There was blood spatter on the walls, on the ceiling. She was stabbed multiple times. I was pretty shocked by the amount of wounds that she had. When I looked at her hand, I saw a large laceration almost in the middle of her hand to be, in my opinion, a defensive wound. Renee was in the fight for her life. 
Unfortunately, she had lost. For detectives, the viciousness of the attack is a clue itself. It appears to us it's a crime of passion. If somebody uh, has something against this victim so much so that they want to brutalize this person as much as they possibly could. This was personal. Somebody went into that residence to murder Renee. Who in Renee's life would want to attack her and could be capable of such violence? Born in 1965, Renee's spirit was always full of joy. Renee was the most generous person I have ever known. She loved life. She was always smiling. Renee Pagel devoted her life to helping others. She was a nurse practitioner. She had done medical mission trips around the world. And then she also worked at a homeless clinic here in town. She always thought about other people. Renee's greatest joy was being a mother of three. She loved her kids so much. She was a great mom. Recently separated from Michael, her husband of 10 years, Renee shared custody of her children while always remaining a devoted mother. The last couple years, because she wanted to be home with her kids and wanted to have some more normal hours, she chose to teach at a technical center. Even as a teacher, Renee found new ways to help people. One of her students had come into class one day and was really down, and, and Renee said, what's the matter? And she said, well, my dad is, is dying. He needs a kidney. And so Renee agreed to give her kidney to this man who she had never met. She was just so selfless. And it manifested itself in so many ways. Renee had undergone the kidney transplant surgery just five days before her stunning death. So she was already in a weakened state when she was attacked. Could the killer have timed the attack, knowing that Renee would be recuperating? Detectives look closer at her injuries, hoping they'll reveal telling details about the murder weapon. It seemed to be a very strong and well-made knife and large. Just the amount of uh, damage it did to the victim's body, it was at least an inch, inch and a half blade that was wide. There's no sign of the knife, but forensic technicians search the bedroom for other evidence. There was large amounts of blood that our scientific support unit had to collect, and they collected trace evidence like hairs and fibers for testing. Detectives continue to search the rest of the home. What struck me about this case that was kind of odd there was no other areas in the house that were disturbed, that were bloody or anything tracked to the home. It seemed to be very honed in on just her bedroom. It really kind of puzzled us as investigators. It was the most bizarre scene I've ever been on. This person, in my opinion, had to know that they had to cover their tracks, and I think it was planned, and they thought this out ahead of time. As forensics continue their work, Detectives speak with Renee's parents. Her father, obviously, he was extremely upset. What he had just found out, his daughter brutally murdered. Detectives ask her father to help them put together a picture of Renee's last known movements. He last saw her the night before, around 4 or 5 in the evening when he was picking up the children and bringing them to their father's house, who lived approximately 15 to 20 minutes away from Renee. With Renee's children safe with their father at the time of the murder, she was home alone. He told us he spoke with her on the phone around 8 or 9 in the evening, just checked in on her because obviously he had a lot of concern of her health. Based on the state of the body, detectives believe Renee was murdered sometime between 11 p.m. and 6 a.m. They ask her parents who Renee might have seen last. Her father talked to me about a tenant 
Mike Decker, who was a acquaintance of Renee that has been living on the property for uh, approximately a year and a half, two years. Also, he did speak about a contentious divorce with her husband, Michael, that she was going through. Mike wanted full custody. Mike wanted the home. Mike wanted to not work and have Renee work and be at the provider. So that obviously piqued my interest. Could either of these men have possibly wanted Renee dead? Detectives know they have to hit the ground running right away. We have to find out who all these people are and go and start to question them to try to find out where they were on the night of the murder. Coming up, investigators uncover an ominous obsession. There was a lot of writings about his hatred for Renee. Alarming secrets. The ceiling had a hidden compartment. Renee told me how betrayed she felt. She was extremely upset. She was very hurt by this. And the truth blindsides everyone. We've never had a, a break like this. It was, you're not going to believe this. Just disbelief. I'm still reeling from that one. Detectives in a small Michigan town are investigating the vicious murder of 41-year-old mother of three, Renee Pagel. Police are looking into two possible suspects, her tenant and her estranged husband. They first turn their attention to Renee's ex, Michael Pagel. In the beginning, they seem like your average all-American couple. She did tell me that she did love him. She wanted marriage in a family, and he was the opportunity. She looked at him, I think the words were, the knight in shining armor. And speaking to friends of the family, they described Michael as a fantastic dad, that he was always about his children. Nobody said anything bad about him. Married life seemed like a dream come true until cracks started to appear. When I interviewed numerous people, I was told that Mike didn't want a full-time job. Mike wanted to be at home with the kids and let Renee do everything and support him. They were just having a lot of issues back and forth with one another. In early 2005, Mike abruptly surprised Renee with divorce papers. She was very shocked and just sickened to the core. There had been some turmoil in the past between them, but in her mind, things were actually getting better. They were kind of turning around, so she was blindsided by it. She said to me, he expected, I mean expected, the house, the kids, and $2,000 a month. In June 2006, just seven weeks before she was murdered, Renee and Michael had their day in divorce court. When the judge ruled in her favor and said that she got the kids, she got the house, and he was going to have to get a better paying job, something flipped in him. Was Michael so angered by the ruling that he killed Renee in a furious rage? There were a lot of things that put him at the top of our list as a potential suspect that had killed Renee. Detectives go to question Michael. When we arrived at Mike's house, he was not there. His mother said that he should be back shortly. And I said, just want to get an idea of what were you guys doing last night? And she said, well, Mike had the kids. They were having a fortnight in the living room where Mike had set up some pillows and some blankets. Then she stated about 8 in the morning, she and Michael had a brief conversation, and then they went about their day. So basically, she was giving him an alibi that he was home all night with the kids. As police finish the interview with his mother, Michael arrives. I explained to him that something had happened to Renee, and we would like to speak to you about this. When Michael was told that she had passed away, there was no reaction out of him. 
And immediately, without me even going any further, uh, Michael reached into his wallet and gave me an attorney card and said, yeah, I've been told not to talk to the police, but here's my attorney. So I thought that was extremely odd that Michael didn't want to dig further into what happened to uh, Renee. After consulting with his divorce attorney, he told investigators he wouldn't answer any questions. Michael's reticence to cooperate is a red flag. And on August 6th, the day after Renee's murder, police arrive at his home with a search warrant. We are looking for any type of knife that may have been used during the murder. We took a lot of knives from the house, but we found no knives that matched the length and the size and, and the different characteristics of the knife that was used. Police also collect hair samples and fingerprints from Michael. We wanted to get photos of his body to make sure that there was no cuts or anything on him. We wanted to look at clothing to see if there was any blood, trace evidence anywhere. All the forensic evidence that we collected, we never found anything that was useful in our investigation. All the knives in his home were examined and there was nothing to link them to this crime. We had no murder weapon. We had no real evidence. There was nothing. It was clean. So when we left that search warrant, I would say we really came out empty-handed. We didn't have anything to tie this murder to Mike Pagel. Despite his potential motive, Michael Pagel drops off detectives' list of suspects. While news of Renee's violent death quickly spreads across town. Her friend called me and said, Chris, Renee's dead. It was surreal. I remember curling up in a fetal position and just screaming. I screamed. I was angry. As her friends and loved ones struggle with her death, Renee's autopsy report comes in. The cause of death was blunt force trauma, homicide. It was a large, heavy-duty knife that was used on her. The autopsy revealed upwards of 50 stab wounds. There were numerous lacerations to the hands and the feet, suggesting defensive wounds. She was stabbed over 50 times. I'm still reeling from that one. It was so brutal. Detectives continue their investigation and now focus their attention on Renee's tenant, Mike Decker. She had this barn that had an upstairs apartment, and he was a renter. The barn was about 75 yards away from the main home. He could have been involved. He could have been a witness. He could have overheard something. One of her friends believed that the week of uh, her surgery, Renee was going to have pizza with Mike Decker and that she felt that there was some type of maybe a relationship going on. So that sparked our interest. I mean, if he's having a relationship with Renee, did something happen to cause him to get upset and potentially do this horrific crime? We had to find him immediately. Two days into the investigation of Renee Pagel's murder, detectives have a possible suspect. Her tenant, Mike Decker, who's rumored to be romantically involved with Renee. Detectives interview Mike at his apartment on Renee's property. At first, I kind of thought loner, 30-year-old gentleman, unemployed, living above a barn. I thought that was kind of odd. When we were speaking to Mr. Decker, we asked him if he's having a relationship with Renee, romantic or whatnot. Mike said that the relationship is more of a friendship or a kindness thing, no romantic involvement. He denied having any dinner with Renee over the past week. He stated that it was actually a month or two before he suggested that they go out for pizza just as friends, but Renee had turned that down because she was busy. Police ask Mike Decker where he was on the night of the murder. He stated that he went into a local city to eat by himself, drove back probably between eight or nine, 
When he arrived at home, he watches a little bit of TV and then goes to bed between 1 and 2 in the morning. Detectives ask him if he heard anything that night, especially after what they had found at the crime scene. We did locate a tire track and a footwear impression in Renee's driveway. He denied hearing anything from Renee's house. Mike tells police he didn't notice anything unusual the next morning either. He woke up in the morning around 9 or 10 and then went to meet with his family to go see a bike race. Part of the problem with Mike Decker's alibi, even though he was cooperative through this process, he was on the property when this murder happened. With no one to corroborate his alibi, police get a warrant to search Mike's apartment. We seized his pipe from his sink because we wanted to see if there was any blood or trace evidence in there, and then we found a couple of large knives. The evidence is rushed to the crime lab for analysis. The knives and the pipe forensically did not show anything. There were no signs of blood. We found no knives that matched the type of knife that was used. But still, Mike cannot be ruled out. A week after the homicide, detectives interview him again, this time at the sheriff's office. He showed no issues of concern of us looking at him as a potential suspect from gathering any type of physical evidence from him. We even offered him a polygraph. And Mr. Decker submitted to that also and and passed without any uh, deceit. With nothing tying Mike Decker to the crime, investigators let him go. Searching for any further clues about Renee, detectives reach out to her parents once again and in turn get a lead on a new suspect, Renee's own sister, Michelle. Renee's father stated that the relationship between Renee and Michelle was strained. He mentioned that Michelle was jealous of Renee's life, of what she had. She wanted a successful career, a family, a home, all of those things. Renee and Michelle's problems went beyond sibling rivalry. During the divorce, Renee's attorney was able to subpoena the phone records of Michael Pagel. So he turned those over to Renee. When she examined phone records, she learned that Mike and Michelle were talking frequently. So she was extremely upset. She was very hurt by this. There was such significant communication between Mike Pagel and the sister Michelle that it raised a red flag to us right away that there might be some sort of affair going on. Renee told me how betrayed she felt by her sister. She really struggled with that. During the interviews with numerous people, it was mentioned that Michelle potentially was having a relationship with Michael. Once I learned that, it's obviously somebody we wanted to look at. Michelle is brought in for an interview. And though she says that she is saddened by her sister's death, her answers raise eyebrows with investigators. She didn't speak very highly of Renee. She was not happy at all the way that uh, Renee was handling the divorce. Michelle clearly took Mike's side in it and kind of put her sister in the bad light. She felt that Mike was a good father, and it was her sister that was really trying to take advantage of him. We did ask her if she was in a relationship or had a relationship with Michael, and she completely denied it. Detectives ask Michelle where she was the night of the murder. She said she was working into the evening, and that evening she was home with her roommate. Basically, she was stating that she was home the evening of the murder. Michelle did take a polygraph, and she was found to be truthful and did not appear to have any involvement in the homicide. With Michelle all but ruled out, investigators discover that she isn't the only family member Renee had issues with. When I spoke with Renee's parents, it was mentioned that Michael, her soon-to-be ex-husband, had a brother. The brother was Charles Pago. They called him Bo. And they said that he was very strange, very odd. He and Renee did not get along. Renee didn't like him. She didn't trust him. When detectives dig deeper, 
they uncover something troubling. We learn from a close friend of Renee that he had been married numerous times, and she believed that maybe Bo had murdered his last wife. Was Bo a killer? And had he now killed again? That obviously raised some red flags for us as investigators, and that's somebody we wanted to speak with very quickly. Detectives investigating the vicious stabbing of Renee Pagel are looking at her estranged husband's brother, Bo Pagel. Bo was married three times in the past, and one of his ex-wives died under suspicious circumstances. One of Renee's friends gives a statement to police claiming that she believed Bo may have killed his ex-wife. Obviously, what really sent us his way was the potential murder of his last wife, so that had our attention. Detectives must determine if Bo could actually be a killer. They look deeper into his background. Bo was a loner, lived at home with his mom. We learned that he was an on-the-road trucker, and he traveled all over the country. He would be gone days at a time. Investigators also look closer at Bo and Renee's fractured relationship. There was clearly bad blood between him and Renee, dating back years, going back to the wedding. We found out that Bo refused to be in the wedding. He was going to be the best man. He did not like her, thought she was not good for Mike, and he didn't approve of it whatsoever. He was outspoken to Michael about even marrying Renee. And I think the relationship between Bo and Mike was really more of an estranged relationship for the 10 years that Mike and Renee were married. But after Renee and Michael's separation, everything changed. I do know that once Mike filed for divorce, he and Bo rekindled that relationship and became pretty close. Bo was, I believe, happy that Renee was now out of the picture and he could have his brother back. Could Bo have wanted Renee permanently out of Michael's life? Detectives bring him in for questioning. So he interviewed Bo and he denied any knowledge of the murder, denied any involvement. Bo had said that through the week he was on the road trucking. He got home Thursday night. Bo's alibi was that he was essentially across the state. He had driven a route the day of the homicide. He had gotten back around 6 o'clock and had gone out with some friends for dinner. And then afterwards, he stated he went home, spoke to his daughter, and then went to bed. And then the next morning, got up and went canoeing with his daughter. We contacted his work. We spoke to the family that he actually uh, had dinner with uh, that Friday evening to account for uh, they were with him, what restaurant, until what time. It pretty much matched up. Though most of his story checks out, no one can confirm that Bo was at home at the time of Renee's murder. Needing more information, detectives reach out to Bo's daughter. We confirmed with her that they went on the canoe trip in the morning. Bo's daughter also puts to rest any suspicion that Bo was responsible for her mother's death. She gave us details about her mother that we didn't know. She was a diabetic, she had some blood sugar problems, and she really didn't care for going to the doctor. So she didn't seek the medical help that she needed, and that ultimately is what resulted in her death. She did not suspect Bo of doing anything. Though Bo's alibi isn't ironclad, there is nothing concrete to link him to Renee's murder, and he is released. It's been six weeks since the homicide, and the investigation has ground to a halt. The reason that we were stuck is because there was no physical evidence that would help tie any one person to this crime. We looked at every person, the strange husband, his brother, Bo, Renee's sister, and Renee's tenant. And there was nothing to link them to this crime. Police continue investigating for many months. But with no fresh leads, the case goes cold. 
it just stalled. There was a point where I felt that we would never have a conclusion in this case. It was just sad that, that we couldn't bring closure to Renee and to her family. As the months went by, I was just like, what is going on? Once the months turns into years, that was uh, disheartening. For 13 years, there are no new developments in the case. But through it all, Renee's best friend never gives up hope. We created a website in the year 2007, and it was a really therapeutic way for people to come and grieve and share stories. And that website was very effective in getting the word out about Renee's murder, doing whatever it took to find justice for Renee. In a stunning turn of events, on November 18th, 2019, Chris Crandall receives a surprising message on social media. Mike's brother, Bo, sent me a friend request. And of course, I was very startled. And it was just after that that I got a message from Bo. All of a sudden, after all these years, Bo wanted to talk. Thirteen years after Renee Pagel is viciously stabbed to death, her best friend receives a message from Renee's brother-in-law, Bo Pagel, wanting to talk. And of course, I called the police and let them know that Bo had contacted me. So we arranged to have the conversation between Chris and Bo recorded. As a former suspect in Renee's murder, was Bo about to confess? He called me clearly wanting to let it be known that Mike was losing it. Bo was afraid that he would be Mike's next victim. And I said to Bo, who do you think Mike's first victim was? And he danced around that and wouldn't answer it. And Bo said, I believe Mike will kill me. And it was then that I was entertaining the idea that Mike was not so innocent. I listened to that conversation and was very concerned. Bo believes Mike's capable of killing somebody. We felt this was a big break. We now knew that Bo may have information about whether or not Mike did commit the murder. On February 3rd, 2020, two months after his conversation with Chris Crandall, police formally interview Bo. I just asked him to tell us what he knew about anybody being involved in Renee's murder. And he quickly told us that Mike Pagel was responsible for Renee's murder. It's a stunning revelation. It was the break we were looking for. It was the big piece of information that we needed. Knowing this is their chance to finally solve Renee's murder, police get an official statement from Bo. Bo laid out the story for us. Back in 2011, Bo and Mike decided to go out. Mike grabbed a six pack of beer and they just drove around and talked as brothers and they stopped over the top of one bridge over a small river, and in the midst of that conversation, Mike produced a bag, and inside the bag was a knife that was wrapped in a cloth, and Mike made the comment to Bo of, this is how I finalized my divorce, which was a complete shock to Bo, and it immediately made Bo angry. He said, I believed you for all these years, we've supported you, and come to find out you're the one responsible. I can't believe you would have done that. And I think this, this made Mike angry. He expected Bo to congratulate him. So the way Bo described it was out of frustration. Mike took the knife and threw it into the river. Bo described it as a, about a 12 inch long, bigger knife. And it 
appeared to be a very strong, sturdy knife. Investigators get both to show them exactly where Michael had thrown the knife. There was quite a bit of old metal, various pieces of cars and other things inside the river. And in my opinion, that wasn't a safe diving environment. We had to find another means to search the bottom of the river. Police wonder if they will be able to recover a knife that has been in the water for nine years. Then, one of the detectives comes up with an idea. It's called a rare earth magnet. The magnet is something that I've had at home, and it just came to mind as an option for a way to search the watery area and to grab whatever metal pieces were on the bottom of the river. It was tremendously impressive for him to come up with his own homemade magnet device, and you know he concocted his own fishing line and pulling it through the stream, which is remarkable. Police spent three days painstakingly dragging the riverbed with no success. So we were on our last few passes of the river, and I began pulling toward my side. And then it was, you're not going to believe this, just disbelief. The knife was stuck to the magnet, and it was exactly as Bo described. It was late in the day, I want to say 3 or 4 o'clock, and we got the phone call. He got the knife. I'm like, no, are you kidding me? He got the knife, no. And this is the magnet and the knife exactly as we found it. It was awesome. It was everything you could hope for when you're investigating a case to get that piece of evidence that you know you need, that you really weren't sure if it was gonna be there, but there it is. Police now need to confirm if the knife found matches the knife used in Renee Pagel's murder. We brought it down to the medical examiner's office. They viewed it and instantly said, absolutely. It's consistent with the injuries that are on Renee's body. We were very confident we had the murder weapon. Unbelievable. We've never had a, a break like this. We got the needle in the haystack by finding the knife, and now we had a murder weapon that backed up what a witness said. It allowed us to validate Bo's statement that that knife was thrown in that water by Mike Pagel. On February 6, 2020, 13 years after Renee's death, Michael Pagel is officially charged with her murder. So this case is going to hinge a lot on the testimony of Bo, but it's still circumstantial evidence. And is a jury going to believe him or not? In the midst of that, the defense attorneys asked if we would consider a plea offer. When someone asks for a plea, it usually means that they're willing to tell the truth. And in this case, that was one of the conditions, is we wanted to hear the truth as part of the plea agreement. The prosecution agrees to a plea deal of second-degree murder and a minimum of 25 years in prison. We wanted to get a term of years to make sure he was old enough that he would never harm anyone again. On May 20th, 2020, 55-year-old Michael Pagel agrees to plead guilty to second-degree murder, avoiding a trial by jury. But at his plea hearing, Michael suddenly turns the case on its head. It was unbelievable. And I just remember being sick to my stomach. After 13 years of investigating the heinous murder of Renee Pagel, her estranged husband is finally being charged for the brutal crime. But at his plea hearing, Michael makes an admission that takes everyone by surprise. I hired my brother, Charles Pagel, to kill Renee Pagel. Charles Pagel murdered Renee Pagel. We were all absolutely shocked when he said that his brother did this. Mike maintained the fact that Bull was the one responsible. He admitted that he had orchestrated it and that he had planned it, but 
insisted that Bull was the one that actually did the stabbing, which is a complete shock to us. We had investigated and we found no evidence, nothing to directly tie Bull Pagel to this murder. Had Bo been hiding his involvement all along? While detectives take another look at him, they also dig for more evidence against Michael. And after several searches of his home, they make a surprising discovery. At Mike's house, we found the ceiling had a hidden compartment. When we took this down, we found three hard drives in this hidden compartment. Investigators spend time decoding the contents of Michael's hard drives, and what they find is chilling. In those hard drives, there was journaling. I would call it strange. It appeared to be written by almost two different personalities, one that would talk back and forth to the other. He talked about planning to divorce, how much he hated her. There was a lot of writings about his dislike and his hatred for Renee. Then, weeks later, police tracked down a crucial witness. We uncovered a friend who had said that he had gifted a knife to Michael that was substantially similar to the one that was actually found. And he admitted that he gave it to Mike as a gift, and it was delivered directly to Mike Pagel. So that helped us put the knife in Mike's hands. So now you have a knife that was found in the river that now a friend is saying had given to Michael and not to Bo. While the evidence is circumstantial, police believe it strengthens their case even further against Michael. There is nothing that could back up Michael's story in terms of physical evidence, any other witnesses, anything else other than his word about it. Whereas Bo at least had stuff to back it up. His alibi backed up and the physical evidence that he provided backed it up. So there's just absolutely nothing that shows that Bo did this. This was Michael Bagel. This was all him that committed this murder that night. Investigators conclude what likely happened on the night of Renee's murder. When the children were sleeping, he snuck out of his house and he went over to Renee's. It's pretty well known that she donated a kidney. Obviously, she wasn't strong at this point. She was asleep in bed, and he walked in with that knife and brutally stabbed her. I believe that Mike no doubt planned this out. There's no way you leave a crime scene that clean and it's not carefully planned. How he absolutely didn't leave a blood drop, a fingerprint, a mark, any physical evidence. Mo tells us about Mike commenting that he had worn coveralls and galoshes. So he had taken precaution to not get his clothes bloody and that he had removed those items and then put them in a garbage bag and left. And that the clothes were later burned. He's not a stupid man. He knew enough to cover his...